Well, good evening, everyone. Is it really important to uh, survive on Monday? So that's always good. Um, thank you so much for everyone being here. My name is Sean Barry. Uh, I'm the facilitator of the, uh, of the event tonight. So I just want to welcome everyone here. Thanks so much for being here. And um, I want to introduce our guest, uh, Dr. Frank Turk. Good evening, Cats. How are you? Just two of your goods? That's it? All right, well, hopefully you'll be better as we move on. What we're going to do is we're going to start, in fact, all the way back in September of 2006. It was September 29th, 2006, when Petty Officer Michael Monsor is a United States Navy SEAL. He's operating in Ramadi, Iraq. Mansoor is standing on a roof in Ramadi, and he's standing in front of a doorway to this roof. He has two Navy SEAL teammates lying in the sniper-prone position at his feet. They've already taken AK-47 fire and a rocket-propelled grenade, but they're not exactly sure where the enemy is. There's a bit of a lull in the fighting. Insurgents have blocked off the streets in Ramadi, and there's someone on the loudspeaker in the town mosque yelling, kill the Americans. As Monsoor and his team are looking for the next attack, an insurgent from an unknown location throws a grenade up on the roof. It hits Monsoor in the chest and it falls to his feet. Due to the length of the throw, there's no opportunity to pick it up and throw it back. He has only a split second to make a decision. He can leap through the doorway behind him and save himself, but if he does, his two teammates lying at his feet will surely die. Monsoor yells, grenade! But instead of jumping backward to save himself, he jumps forward chest first onto the grenade. It detonates. 30 minutes later, 25-year-old Michael Monsoor is dead. His two teammates lying at his feet receive only minor injuries because Monsoor's body muffled the blast. One of the survivors said at Monsoor's funeral, Mikey looked death in the face that day and said, you will not take my friends, I will go in their stead. I've never seen a United States president cry until April of 2008. That's when President George W. Bush invited Monsoor's parents into the East Room of the White House to give them their son's Medal of Honor posthumously. The president couldn't even get through the citation without breaking down. Since then, Monsoor's High School in Garden Grove, California built a new stadium. They named it Michael A. Monsoor Memorial Stadium. The golden trident insignia that the seals wear dominates the 50-yard line. January 2019, North Island, California, just outside of San Diego, the United States Navy commissioned the USS Michael Monsoor, the newest guided missile destroyer in the fleet, Zumwalt class. I was just in San Diego a few months ago and that ship was sitting right there in the harbor. This is Monsoor's mother, Sally, being escorted onto the ship, named in honor of her fallen son. Now, why did they do this? Because Michael Monsoor literally sacrificed himself to save his friends. There's no greater love than to sacrifice yourself to save your friends, said Jesus of Nazareth before he went to the cross. Michael Monsoor sacrificed himself to save his friends. The question is, would anyone sacrifice himself to save you? And the answer is, Someone already has. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. But in our culture, of course, many people don't think the story is true. They think this is all invented, that these New Testament writers were religious people, so they invented it. And we can't believe this anyway. It's got miracles in it, like a resurrection. Who here has ever seen anyone rise from the dead after you knew they were dead for at least 36 hours? Yeah, none of us. Yet if you're a Christian, you have to believe something none of us have ever seen. Now, how rational is that? 
Actually, I think it's quite easy to show that Christianity is true. You only need to answer four questions. In other words, if you investigate these four questions, I think you'll realize that the answer to these four questions is yes. And if the answer to these four questions is yes, then Christianity is true. What are the four questions? Here are the four questions. Now that is some pretty grooving music, isn't it? Yes, that's actually from our TV show, which is on every Wednesday nights, Direct TV Channel 378. If you don't have Direct TV, it's on Roku. If you don't have Roku and you don't have Direct TV, it's on this new technology sweeping Burlington, Vermont right now. It's called the internet. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah, it's on our website right there, crossexamine.org. Also on radio every Saturday morning in a number of stations around the country, but it's podcasts that you can listen to it any time you want. It's called the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast, and what we do is we present evidence for Christianity, and we cross-examine ideas against it. Now, why are these the four questions? Truth, God, miracles, and the New Testament. And this is going to serve as our outline here tonight. We're going to go through these four questions, and then if I time this just right, we'll have absolutely no time for your questions. No, 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 we'll have time for Q&A later, all right? First question, does truth exist? Why is that important? Because you hear people saying there's no truth. You got your truth, I got my truth, right? If there's no truth, Christianity can't be true. Of course, if there's no truth, atheism can't be true either. Now, of course, there's truth. I mean, if there wasn't truth, would you ever go to school? Would, would you pay thousands of dollars to go to the University of Vermont if there wasn't truth? I mean, why would you come here? What's the point? If there was no truth, would you ever read a book? Of course not. Of course, there's truth. In fact, if there, if there was no truth, could you ever catch someone in a lie? No, lies presuppose truth. So we're going to cover that question first. Second question, does God exist? I hope to show you tonight that there really is a theistic God. What's a theistic God? A spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator who created all things and sustains all things. In fact, we're going to look at three arguments for, these, for this being. These arguments are taught in the Bible, but you don't need the Bible to know them. You can show that God exists without any reference to any religious work. The third question is, are miracles possible? Why is that important? Because Christianity cannot be true if there are no miracles. But I hope to show you tonight that not only has the greatest miracle in the Bible already occurred, even atheists are admitting the evidence for that miracle. Then we're going to get to the key question, is the New Testament true? The New Testament doesn't have a prayer if there's no truth, no God, or no miracles. But if truth exists, if God exists, if miracles are possible, then we can see if the documents that comprise the New Testament are actually historically reliable enough to let us know whether one event from the ancient world took place, an event that's critical to Christianity. Anyone know what that event is? Yeah, the resurrection, because if Jesus rose from the dead, game over, Christianity's true. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, game over, it's false. And even the Apostle Paul said this to the church at Corinth. He said, if, you're, if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, your faith's in vain. Do you realize Christianity is a worldview you can investigate and discover whether or not it's true? It's not just someone's philosophy. It's actually grounded in historical facts. And from this point, by the way, if Jesus rose from the dead... And we've got reliable documents. We don't have, they don't have to be inerrant. We just got to see if they're historically reliable enough. If he were predicted and accomplished his own resurrection from the dead, then whatever he teaches is true because he's God. He's risen from the dead. He taught the entire Old Testament as the word of God, and he promised the New Testament. You say, well, why would I trust Jesus? Look, I just have a personal policy. If somebody predicts and accomplishes his own resurrection from the dead, I just trust whatever the guy says, okay? So that's the big picture, and what we're going to do right now is we're going to start right here at point one, does truth exist? You guys ready to go? Yep. All right. Now, whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson, right? Because Tom Cruise had him on the witness stand, and he said to him, Colonel, I want the truth. And Nicholson said, oh, man, that could have been the lamest ever, all right? Cats, he didn't say it that way. He didn't say, you can't handle the truth. If he said it that way, the movie would have gone nowhere. Here, much better. That's right. This is how we 
to say. Someone's talking, you just stop and say, you can't handle the truth. Well, there's a lot of people that can't handle the truth. They're saying, you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative. Well, what we're about to talk about was the most important thinking skill I ever learned. I was 33 years old, already had a master's degree, and I did not know what I'm about to tell you now to show you what a dimwit I was. Because this is actually a thinking skill where you're applying one of the laws of logic. And so much of what you hear in our culture today violates one of the laws of logic. So it can't be true. How many people here have ever taken a course in logic? Logic. Right, you see these people with their hands up? Here are the homeschoolers right here. Okay. Right. This thinking skill is so powerful that once you understand it, whether you're a Christian or not, it's going to help you dramatically to avoid things that are false because that's what this thinking skill will help you do. And so many of the things that are said in our culture are logically false. And the best way of showing you the thinking skill is to give you an example of using it. If someone were to say, there is no truth, you should ask that person a question. What should the question be? Yeah, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true. But it claims to be true. Did I say that right? Can everybody see that this is a self-defeating statement? Can everybody see that this violates itself? It's like saying I can't speak a word in English to say there is no truth because it's a truth claim. And here is, here is the thinking skill you got to get good at doing. You got to turn the claim on itself. Turn the claim on itself. So if somebody says there's no truth, you turn the claim on itself and you ask, is that true? All right, let's do a few more of these. Suppose someone says there's no such thing as absolute truth. If you turn the claim on itself, what question might you ask back? Is that absolutely true? Yeah, is that absolutely true? Or is that an absolute truth? Are you absolutely sure? Because this is an absolute truth claim, claiming there are no such thing as absolute truths. It's like saying I can't speak a word in English. It's like saying my parents had no kids that lived. It's like saying my brother is an only child, right? These are self-defeating statements. They violate the law of non-contradiction, one, one of the most fundamental laws of all logic. Now, in our culture, it's not often said this way. Now, it's more often said this way. There isn't the truth, only my truth. You've probably heard people say that, right? You live your truth, I'll live my truth. You live your truth, I'll live my truth. We'll all get along, right? There's just one big problem with it. If you turn the claim on itself, what question might you ask back to somebody who says this? This is the interactive portion of the program. What, what would you say? Is that you could say, is that true for everybody? That's close, but you might say this. Is that just your truth or the truth? Look, is this statement up here just your truth? In other words, is it just your opinion? Because if it is, okay, well, it's just your opinion. But if you're saying this statement up here is the truth, well, the first half of the statement says there are no, there are no such thing as the truth. Can everybody see that this is a the truth statement claiming there are no such thing as the truth statements? It violates itself. I know this is very unpopular in our culture today, but there's no such thing as your truth or my truth. There's just the truth. I mean, if you're going to say you have your own truth, you might as well say I have my own math, right? There's, there's not my math or your math. There's just math. That's just the way reality is. Now, actually, sometimes it's said more often this way. It's true for you, but not for me. You've probably heard people say that. Well, Christianity may be true for you. Buddhism's true for me. Now, how do you respond to that? Rob, you had it earlier. Yeah, you say, is that true for everybody? It's true for you, but not for me. True for everybody? Because if true for you, but not for me, it's true for everybody. Then true for you, but not for me can't be true because it's true for everybody. Did I say that right? I know this can give you intellectual constipation if you think about it long enough. Because that's because it's self-defeating. It's like saying I can't speak a word in English. Actually, there's a more fun way of dealing with this. If somebody says it's true for you, but not for me, say, sure, go try that with your bank teller. Yeah, go to your bank teller and say, look, the economy's down, inflation's up, I need some extra money. Bank teller looks at your account and says, I'm sorry, I only have $6.12 in your account. It's easy to get the money. You simply say, ha, that's true for you, but not for me. Hey, are you going to get the money? No. If there's, only, there's really only $6.12 in your account, that's true for all people at all times in all places when referring to your account at that time. It's just true. 
And the same thing is true, by the way, when it comes to religious beliefs. Look, either God exists or he doesn't, regardless of what you believe about it. Either Jesus rose from the dead or he didn't, regardless of what you believe about it. I mean, I often ask people, I, I say, do you think Christianity is true? And most people who are church people will say, well, yeah, I think Christianity is true. And then I ask them why. Do you know what answer I get more than any other? Because I have faith. Is that a good answer? Does your faith change whether or not God exists or Jesus rose from the dead? No, your faith doesn't change a thing about those things. I mean, do you have to believe something to make it true? Do you have to believe in gravity to stay on the ground? Do people who don't believe in gravity float away? Hey, look, there's another one. <laughs> hey, if you believe, you'll come back. No, that's not the way it works. You say, well, why is the Bible always talking about faith then? Because there's two kinds of faith. There's belief that, and then there's belief in. This is a very important distinction. Belief that is getting evidence that something's true. This is in Christianity, we call this apologetics. Doesn't mean we're saying we're sorry, it means we're giving evidence for what we believe. We're trying to see if God exists and Jesus rose from the dead. But all the belief that in the world won't get your moral transgressions forgiven. For that, you gotta go from belief that to belief in. There's a difference. In fact, James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote that little book in the New Testament called? You guys are sharp at the University of Vermont tonight. Yes, James said, even the demons believe that God exists, but they tremble. Do you realize that if God exists, and he does, and if demons exist, and they do, that demons know that God exists better than we do? <laughs> but they don't trust in him. They don't want to trust in him. There's a difference between belief that and belief in. In fact, we know this in relationships. When I first met my wife 37 years ago, I got evidence that she would be a good wife, but all the evidence in the world didn't make her my wife. I had to take a step of trust in her to ask her to be my wife. And in a momentary lapse of judgment, she said yes. That's the difference between belief that and belief in. In fact, some of you young ladies in here, you might be dating somebody and you like this person and you're of marrying age and you want this guy to ask you to marry you. And what if he came up to you and he said, I believe that you would make a great wife. What would you say to him? You'd go, yeah, and, and, is that it? You just believe that I'd make a great, what, what, what about believing in me? What about trusting in me? There's a difference, right? Belief that is just intellectual. Belief in is not only intellectual, it's volitional. Belief that is of the, of the head. Belief in is not only of the head, it's of the heart. Most of the time when the Bible's talking about faith, it's talking about the second kind. After you know that Jesus is the Savior, trust in him. But faith is not blind. Faith is trusting in what you have good evidence to believe. Trusting in what you have good evidence to believe. You're trusting in these chairs are going to hold you up right now. You didn't even think about it when you sat down, but you had evidence that these chairs are sturdy because this is a great, beautiful building. And by the way, the people who are helping us here, Maureen is in the back, and you have Addie over here, and there's some other folks back there. They help put this on, so give them a round of applause if you would. And thank you for... So you trusted that these chairs would hold you up, right? You didn't even think about it. But that's the difference between belief that and belief in. You saw it, and then you sat in it. Uh, how about this, by the way? Here's another statement you're going to hear quite a bit. There's, that all truth comes from science. There's no truth in anything but science. If you turn the claim on itself, what are you going to say back to the person who says this? This is the interactive portion of the program. Come on. Just ask the question, is that a, is that a scientific truth? No, this is a philosophical claim. That's not a statement of science, that's a statement about science. In fact, you can't do science without philosophy. When you get a PhD here at the University of Vermont, what does the PH stand for? It's not, philosophy, it's not phenomenally dumb, no. It's philosophy of, philosophy of physics, philosophy of biology, philosophy of medicine, philosophy of history, whatever it is. Philosophy undergirds everything we do. You can't understand the Bible without philosophy. You can't understand anything written without philosophy. Philosophy is right thinking about reality. In fact, in the book over here, Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case, we have a chapter on science. Here's the title of the chapter. Science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. Why do I say that? Because all data needs to be gathered and all data needs to be interpreted, and who does that? Scientists do that. 
And sometimes they may get bad data or they may have good data but not interpret it right. I mean, you ever wonder why you get conflicting advice on COVID? Because scientists are interpreting data and some of them are interpreting it differently than other scientists, that's why. You ever wonder why you have some people saying that we evolved without intelligent intervention and then we have other people saying, no, there was intelligent intervention to how human beings came into being. Why do we have PhD scientists disagreeing? Because they're all looking at the same evidence, but they might have philosophical presuppositions that caused them to actually interpret the data a certain way. For example, there's only two possible causes to how life got here. It was a natural cause or an intelligent cause. Now, some people will rule out intelligent causes before they look at the evidence. If that's the case, when they look at the evidence, there's only one possible cause that they could say brought life here, and that would be a natural cause. Now, maybe they're right about that, but if you're ruling out the only other possibility, you might be ruling out the right answer, right? That's a result of a philosophical presupposition, not the evidence. By the way, science is wonderful, it's beautiful, it helps us live longer, it builds beautiful buildings like this and all this, keeps us warm and comfortable, but science is not the most important thing in life. Honey, do you love me? Yeah. Why? I don't know, let's run an experiment. No, that's not the way life works, right? <laughs> There's much more important things than science. Or how about this? You're going to hear this a lot. You ought not judge. In fact, some people are going to say, you're a Christian? Jesus said, don't judge. Why are you judging? First of all, let's leave Jesus aside for just a second. What's the problem with the claim? Someone says you ought not judge. You might want to ask them, hey, isn't that a judgment? You see, this is a judgment. Or you might say, if we're not to judge, why are you judging me for judging? You say, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say don't judge? Nope. Never said it. Sure he did. He said it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. This is right in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount, his most famous sermon. Okay, I know this is going to sound odd for just a second, but it's true. There are no verses in the Bible. There are no verses in the Bible. When were the chapter and verse divisions added to the Bible? Matthew didn't put them in his gospel, right? When were they added? About 500 years ago to help us navigate the text, which is important. Why? because it would be really hard to find your way around this big, long series of books without numbers. I mean, imagine you go to church one Sunday and you don't have numbers in your Bible, your pastor doesn't have numbers in his Bible, and he just looks at you and he goes, let's go about two-thirds of the way in, let's see if we can find the same spot. No, you wouldn't be able to do that, right? You need numbers to help you navigate. The problem is we tend to think if it's got a number in front of it, we can take it out and make it say whatever we want. By the way, this is why some of you Christians in here who keep quoting Jeremiah 29, 11 as if it applies to you, like if it's a promise to you, you ought not do that. Why? Does anyone know the verse I'm talking about? Oh, the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you health and a future and all these things. Who is that a promise to? Is that 21st century Christians? No, that was a promise to, to uh, people that went to Babylon in 586 B.C., so unless you're 2,600 years old living under Nebuchadnezzar in modern-day Iraq, um, that, that promise is not a promise to you. And, and in fact, you see this, Jeremiah 29, 11, on birthday cards, on pillows, on posters. I mean, it's everywhere. It's not a promise to us. In fact, I always ask people that think, they think it's a promise to us today, why, why don't you quote Jeremiah 44, 11? What's Jeremiah 44, 11? Jeremiah 44, 11 is what God promised to do to the exiles that went to Egypt. And he told them, don't go to Egypt in 586 B.C. Do you know what Jeremiah 44, 11 says? I will destroy you in all Judah. You don't see that stitched into a pillow. You don't see that on a birthday card. Happy birthday. I will destroy you in all Judah. No, you don't, thank you. That is so sweet, Grandma. Yeah, you, don't, you don't see that, right? Because we're taking stuff out of context. We've got to read around the verse, and the same thing is true in Matthew 7, 1, where Jesus says, judge not. He doesn't stop saying, he doesn't just say, judge not and stop. What does he say? Judge not, lest you be judged. By the same standard you judge others, you'll be judged by that standard. So before you try and take the speck out of your brother's eye, you hypocrite, which is a judgment, by the way, take the log out of your own eye first, then you'll be better able to help your brother. Is Jesus telling us not to judge here? 
No, he's telling us to take the speck out of our brother's eye. That involves making a judgment. He's simply saying, get that problem out of your life first so you can better help your brother. So this is not a command not to judge. It's a command on how to judge. In fact, Jesus elsewhere, John 7, 24 says, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Everybody makes judgments. The only question is, are your judgments true? Whether you're a Christian, not a Christian, atheist, Buddhist, Muslim, whoever you are, you're making judgments. In fact, you wouldn't even be alive if you didn't make judgments. You'd be dead already. You made 100 judgments getting over here tonight. And now you're going, this was a bad judgment. This guy's crazy, right? No. Everybody makes judgments. The only question is, are your judgments true? I will say, though, Jesus did save a very stern rebuke for people who were judgmental. And who were the judgmental ones in his day? Pharisees. The Pharisees. And who were the Pharisees? They were the religious and political leaders of Israel. They were the politicians. Why? They were on the Sanhedrin. Those are the people that ran Israel. And Jesus went after these people. Are you telling me Jesus got involved politically? Yes! And he wasn't so nice doing it. In fact, if you think Jesus was a sweet guy who's never said a bad word about anyone, you have not read John chapter 2, John chapter 8, or Matthew chapter 23. What happens in John chapter 2? Jesus makes a whip and he goes and he jacks people up in the temple. What? Sweet and gentle Jesus said this? Yes! And then in John chapter 8, he's talking to these same Pharisees. He's having an argument with them. And he's right in the middle of the argument when he says, your father is the devil. Jesus, you can't say that. That's not very Christ-like. Hey, excuse me, I am Christ. Can you imagine you're having an argument with somebody and you stop right in the middle and you go, your father is the devil. Never try that with a sibling, by the way. And then in Matthew 23, what does Jesus say? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Oh, you look great on the outside. You're whitewashed tombs, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You go a mile to make a convert, and then once you make them a convert, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. How will you avoid being condemned to hell? What? Sweet and gentle Jesus said this? Yes, Jesus was not Barney, okay? He was tough. In fact, why'd they kill him? Number one, he claimed to be God. That was blasphemy to the Jews and sedition to the Romans. And number two, he spoke truth to power, particularly the temple authorities who knew if Jesus had succeeded, they'd be out of a job. You remember the high priest Caiaphas? What did he say after Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead? He said, it's better that one innocent man die than the whole nation perish. He wanted to keep his power, and so what he did was he decided Jesus needed to die so I can keep my power. All right, now, we could talk a lot more about this, but we don't have time. Can everybody just point out, or can everybody just see here that this statement right here shoots itself? Can everybody see that? Okay, because it's self-defeating. All the other statements we just went through, you can't judge, it's true for you but not for me, uh, you get all your truth from science, these are all self-defeating as well. So relativism and postmodernism are false because they claim it's true that there is no truth. Now a little bit later we're going to have the microphone set up for Q&A. And uh, this is actually a picture when we were at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And uh, I, I, I may ask you a question if you get up to the microphone. It's not fair for me to do that unless I warn you in advance. Here's the question I might ask you if you have a question, if you're not a Christian in particular. And the question is this. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Because I've had atheists stand at that microphone in front of hundreds of people and say, no. I always ask, wait, I thought you claimed to be reasonable. I thought you claimed to be rational. Why wouldn't you believe it if it were true? Well, it's not a head issue. It's a heart issue. They don't want it to be true. They don't want there to be a God. They want to be God of their own lives, and they don't want people getting in the way of what they want to do. And I understand that. I was 20 at one point. See, most people are not on a truth quest. You know what we're on? We're on a happiness quest. We're just going to believe whatever, they, whatever we think is going to make us happy. Here's the problem. You can make yourself happy over the short term, doing a lot of fun but selfish things, yet over the long term, it's a disaster. And everyone in this room, the few of us in here are over 40, knows what I'm talking about because many of us have tried to get happiness ourselves doing it our way, right? 
You want to get true contentment, you got to go straight through truth. So, and Jesus is the truth, all right? So, I just wanted to let you know that when we get there, I may ask you that question. So, truth exists. Next question, does God exist? And I said there are three arguments for the existence of God we're going to look at. The first argument is the argument for the beginning of the universe, known as the cosmological argument. And that comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe. It says if the universe had a beginning, then it must have had a beginner. The second argument is the argument from design, known as the teleological argument. Telos is a Greek word meaning design or purpose. And it says if there's design in the universe and design in life, there must be a designer. Now, these arguments have some scientific evidence behind them. We'll see that here in a minute. Third argument doesn't have any science behind it. Yet it's the argument we've all understood since we were very small children. It's the argument from morality known as the moral argument. And it says if there's one thing morally wrong out there, just one, like it's wrong to torture babies for fun, or it's wrong to murder six million people in a holocaust, then there has to be a God. Why? Because if there is no standard beyond humanity, then everything's just a matter of opinion. That would just be your opinion against a baby torturer's opinion or your opinion against Hitler's opinion. If there's no standard of righteousness outside of ourselves that we're obligated to obey, everything's a matter of opinion. Well, we know torturing babies for fun isn't a matter of opinion. We know the Holocaust wasn't just a matter of opinion. If that's the case, there must be this standard known as God's nature outside of ourselves. In fact, this is how our country began. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men were created and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. By the way, this university was founded in 1791, the same year the Bill of Rights was ratified, which of course came after the Declaration of Independence. But we'll get to the moral argument later. We gotta start right here at the cosmological argument. Now you gotta admit, it was worth coming here tonight just to see God do that. Did you see that? Some of you have said, I've never seen God move. Oh really? Check this out. Look at that, right there. Now, this is the argument that many say points back to the big... Now, I know there may be some Christians here saying, uh, Frank, uh, you know, we're Christians in here, and uh, we don't believe in the Big Bang. You guys don't believe in the Big Bang? I believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. In fact, the evidence for the Big Bang is so good that even atheistic scientists like Stephen Hawking, who passed away about six years ago, but he was the top physicist in the world, at least most popular anyway, when he died, put it this way, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, Hawking tried to come up with another, another cause other than God. He failed, but he's admitting the data. Alexander Vilenkin, who teaches not far from here at Tufts University, who is a cosmologist, put it this way. He's an agnostic, doesn't know whether God exists or not, said, with the proof now in place, cosmologist, by the way, a cosmologist is not someone that puts on your makeup, all right? A cosmologist is someone that studies the universe. Cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is now no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, it's interesting that he would use the word proof. Why? Because scientists rarely use that word because science is tentative. Oh, there's new evidence that could come in and change this, right? But Vilenkin says the evidence is so strong from so many sectors that he's going to call it a proof. The other interesting word is the word problem. Why is it a problem that all of nature had a beginning? Because that would mean that something outside of nature brought it into existence. Now, we're not going to look at the evidence for this. Why? Number one, we don't have time. Number two, it's all in the book. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, chapter three. And number three, it's not controversial. Even the atheists are admitting it. What is controversial is what caused the universe. Not that it had a beginning. So let's just jump to that point. What actually caused the universe? And we've got a couple options here. If the universe had a beginning, it must have had a beginner. Either no one created something out of nothing, which is the atheistic view, or someone created something out of nothing, which is the theistic view. Now, here's my only question. Which view is more reasonable? What do you think? Theistic view. Yeah, the theistic view. Number two, everybody seems to know that, although some people will deny it. There are some atheists that think it's more reasonable that no one created something out of nothing. How does that make any sense? I don't think it does. In fact, here's a question to ask an atheist. 
If there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing at all? In other words, if there is no God, why does anything exist? Now, when we say God, we mean an uncaused first cause that caused everything else. And think about it this way. If space, time, and matter had a beginning, which is what the evidence shows, then whatever created space, time, and matter can't be made as space, time, and matter. In other words, the cause must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing, personal in order to choose to create, because to go from a state of nothingness to a state of creation, someone had to make a choice, and only persons can make choices. Also, the being would have to be intelligent to have a mind to make a choice. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? God. You say, well, how do you know it's a Christian God, Frank? The answer is, we don't. Yet, this could be Allah or some other theistic God. But if we keep going through the evidence and we realize that Jesus really rose from the dead, then we can say that the same being that walked out of the tomb 1,990 years ago is the same being in whose divine nature created the universe out of nothing. We haven't gotten there yet, but we have six attributes for what could be the Christian God. Next argument we'll spend a little bit more time on is the teleological argument, the design argument, and there are two aspects to this. The universe appears designed, and so do you. Let's start with the universe first. Scientists have discovered in recent decades the universe is fine-tuned, that if you were to change any one of a number of factors virtually imperceptibly about our universe, either the universe wouldn't exist, or if it did, it couldn't support life. Even atheists like Stephen Hawking admit this. Here's what Hawking said. If the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. If the expansion rate was that infinitesimally different, none of us would be here. How did this happen? It seems to me the same being that created space, time, and matter is the same being that fine-tuned the expansion rate to be precisely what it needed to be. If it was any different, none of us would be here. By the way, the same thing is true with the gravitational force. If it were altered by more than one part in 10 to the 40th power, we wouldn't be here. What's one in 10 to the 40th power? That's one part in one with 40 zeros following it. You say, Frank, I can't get my head around that number. Let me give you an illustration of it then. Stack the entire North American continent in dimes all the way to the moon. That's 230 or 8,000 miles, something like that. And then do that on a billion other North American continents. Then take all those dimes, mark one of them red, mix the red dime in that huge pile, blindfold a friend, throw him on the pile, say pick one dime at random, the chances that he would pick the one red dime would be one in 10 to the 40th power. I can pick it. Yeah, is he gonna be able to do that? No, he's not gonna pick the red dime. Look, there's only two possibilities for this value being where it is. Somebody designed it to be there, or it wasn't designed to be there. What makes more sense? What do you think? Somebody designed it. And these are just a couple out of more than a dozen of these parameters. Change any one of them. That imperceptibly, we don't exist. And our solar system also, also appears to be designed with us in mind. Let's take a look at the solar system. Here we are, third rock from the sun. If we were just a little bit closer to or a little bit further away, we couldn't survive. A little bit closer to, we'd burn up. A little bit further away, we'd freeze. We are what scientists call the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It is? That's a lie. It's way too cold here in the summer, in the winter. Actually, the summer too, isn't it? Do you get, do you get over 60 in the summer? Oh, yeah, you get way over that. You know, I haven't been in Burlington. The last time I was in Burlington was 50 years ago. 50 years ago. I was, I was 11, and my parents took us all the way through the, I'm from New Jersey, but took me all the way through the Thousand Islands and all this, and then right through Burlington. We took a ferry from here to Plattsburgh, and uh, Ron, you were saying, or Rob, you were saying that's a, an hour-long ferry. It no longer runs, right? But it's a, it's a beautiful area. It's just cold. I live in North Carolina now. Anyway, the axial tilt, 23 and a half degrees. Change that slightly, we don't exist. 
Earth rotation, 24 hours, change that slightly, we don't exist. The size and distance of the moon from us, change that slightly, we don't exist. In fact, if Jupiter was not in its current orbit, we couldn't exist here. Why not? What does Jupiter do for us? Anyone know? It's a cosmic vacuum cleaner. Its gravitational force is so strong that it attracts most of the meteors and space junk to it rather than us. In fact, if you take a close-up look at Jupiter, you see these purple marks? Those are comet fragment strikes that are bigger than the Earth. Thank God for Jupiter. In fact, you want to see the size of the planets? Here they are. There's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth. Look at poor Pluto down here. You know, Pluto recently has been demoted as a planet. I don't know about you, but I think it's size discrimination. And what if Pluto identifies as a planet? What then? Take a look at this. You can hardly see Pluto. Take a look at this. That's Arcturus. That's another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun. Jupiter is one pixel in size on this scale. Earth is invisible. Pluto, forget about it. All right, keep an eye on Arcturus now. Where's Arcturus now? Way over here, see it? That's Arcturus, another star, or Antares, another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun. It's one pixel in size on this scale. Jupiter is invisible. Earth, Pluto, forget about them. In fact, if the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse here would be five or six Empire State Buildings high. The heavens are awesome. And the average distance between stars in our galaxy is 30 trillion miles, and all that distance is necessary for us to exist here on Earth. Now, how far is 30 trillion miles? Far. You must be a math major. Yeah, it would take us at least, uh, it would take you at least two tanks of gas in a Toyota Prius to go 30 trillion miles, all right? Now, just how far is 30 trillion miles? Think about this. When the space shuttle was in orbit, remember we used to have a space shuttle, it used to go around the Earth, right? It would orbit every hour and a half or so, hour and 15 minutes. It was going 18,000 miles an hour. That's five miles per second. You got trouble getting to school in the morning? Take the space shuttle, right? Five miles a second. Think about how fast that is. Well, imagine you could go five miles a second. You could get in the space shuttle. How long would it take you to go from our star, the sun, to another star an average distance away in our galaxy, 30 trillion miles? How long would it take us, do you think? Anyone? It would take us 201,450 years. That means if you got in the space shuttle at the time of Christ, and started traveling from our star, the sun, to another star an average distance away inside our galaxy, you've been going five miles a second for 2,000 years, you would be less than one hundredth of the way there right now. And we're going to explore space. No, we're not. We're not going anywhere in space. It, you know how long it took us to get to Pluto? Nine years to Pluto. And think about this. Here's our, if our solar system was the size of a quarter with the sun at the center and Pluto at the outer rim, you know when the next nearest star is? It's two football fields away. If you could go light speed, 186,000 miles per second, it would take you almost four years to get to the next nearest star. And notice what the psalmist says about the size of the universe. He says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far, as high as the heavens are above the earth. How high are the heavens above the earth? Close. Someone said infinite. Close. You really can't get close to infinite, but when you think about what we're about to show here, it seems infinite to us. In fact, you see this? I don't know if you can see the bottom of this. This is uh, the southern hemisphere, and these are mountains down here. Okay, I'm going to show you a video taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. This is called Hubble Ultra Deep Field. A number of years ago, they trained Hubble on 1 26 millionth of the sky. 
What's 1 26 millionth of the sky? Go outside tonight, put a piece of rice on the end of your finger, hold it up. That piece of rice represents about 1 26 millionth of the sky. So they trained Hubble on this for about 11 days of exposure time. This is called Hubble Ultra, Ultra Deep Field, and you can see this on the internet. This is common domain or public domain. You can look it up. I'm going to show you the video they put together. There's no audio, just video. You guys ready? When I play this, the constellations are going to come up, and then you're going to see what Hubble found. So here we go. There are the constellations. Now let's see what Hubble found in 1 26 millionth of the sky. are nearly 10,000 galaxies. Each of these galaxies allegedly has billions of stars of their own. If you find 10,000 galaxies in 1 26 millionth of the sky, and each of these galaxies have billions of stars, how many stars are there in the entire universe? The number of stars in the entire universe are about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches, on all the earth, times 100,000. And to go from one star to another star going five miles a second just in our galaxy will take you over 200,000 years. Now you know what the Bible means when it says the heavens declare the glory of God. In fact, there's a problem, however, because if this is supposed to represent God's nature in a visual way, a conceptual way, this also represents his attributes. And one of his attributes is justice, which means he's infinitely just. If he's infinitely just, none of us are going to make it because we've all been unjust in our lives. So what's the solution? Actually, the second half of the verse I just showed you tells you the solution. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. How does he remove our transgressions from us? He's infinitely just. How does he do it? He adds humanity to his deity. He comes to earth he allows the creatures who rebelled against him to torture and kill him so he could take their punishment on himself. That's why Jesus is the only way. It's not an arbitrary statement. It's because there's no other way an infinitely just being can allow unjust creatures like ourselves to go unpunished unless he punishes an innocent substitute in our place and that's exactly what he does. Christianity is not a set of rules about trying to make your way to heaven. Christianity is acknowledging that God came to earth to provide a way to heaven by paying the punishment for our sins. Now, when you think about a universe that has stars equivalent to sand grains on 100,000 earths, and it's going to take you over 200,000 years at five miles a second to, to go between two of them. Does that make you feel insignificant? Yeah. It shouldn't. Why? Because the heavens aren't made in the image of God, but you are. In fact, the heavens were made for you. And here's the second part of the design argument. You're designed. In fact, this is you in the womb at 11 weeks. Question, is this animal, mineral, vegetable, or human? Human. In fact, let's go back to when, let's go back prior to 11 weeks. Let's go back to when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see some older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case you've forgotten how this works. When your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your mother perfumed her, e her egg to attract your father, and then your father sent the entire population of the United States, 300 million soldiers, 
toward your mother's egg. It's the same. You say, wait a minute, Frank, you can't legislate morality. All right, no extra charge for this, friends. This was the subject of our first book, creatively titled Legislating Morality. All laws legislate morality. Every law declares one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. The only question is, whose morality will we legislate? And when people say, well, don't, don't impose your morality on me, I say, why not? Would that be immoral? See, because you're imposing your morality on me right now. You're saying I ought not impose ought nots. But you're imposing that ought not on me. Actually, there's a better answer to this. When somebody says you ought not impose your morality on people, I always say it's not my morality. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder's wrong. I didn't make up the fact that abortion's wrong, that rape is wrong, that theft is wrong, that men were made for women and women were made for men. And the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society is to legally recognize that man-woman relationship over every other relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This isn't my morality. This isn't your morality. This just happens to be the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. The one the Apostle Paul said, the Gentiles are not of the law of the law written on their hearts. So if you have a problem with the morality, you don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with the creator upon whose nature this morality is derived. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's go back to this. From this point till right now, a construction project of astonishing complexity began taking place. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second, for most of you anyway. Some cells became brain cells, others heart cells, others lung cells. How did they know how to do this? Nobody knows. Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this very moment. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million. Knock it off. Are you thinking about this? Are you concentrating going, wait a minute, Frank, hang on, I got to make new red blood cells. Coming right up. No. This is just happening. How is it happening? Aristotle noticed something 2,400 years ago. He didn't know anything about blood cells, but he knew that all of nature is going in a direction. For example, why does an acorn, if it's properly nourished, always go in the direction of becoming an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree or a birch tree or a maple tree? See, this is all maple trees. That's what Maureen said. This whole thing is made out of maple. This is Vermont, Vermont maple right here. Or why does it become a seahorse? Because it's programmed to become an oak tree. Well, who programmed it? And it, it, is, is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn in the ground thinking, all right, what do I have to do to become an oak tree? No. But if it's properly nourished, it reliably goes in the direction of becoming an oak tree. If it doesn't have a mind of its own, and of course an acorn doesn't, yet it reliably goes in a direction, there must be an external mind directing it toward an end. That is what Aristotle called the unmoved mover. Thomas Aquinas came along in the 1200s AD and he said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God, that everything's going in a direction. If it's going in a direction, there must be a director. By the way, this is, this is why we can do science, ladies and gentlemen. Because the universe is orderly. Things go consistently in a direction. It's not random. It's not chaotic. That presupposes some orderer. Now notice, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a big bang caused way back when. That's another argument. This is a cause every single second the universe exists. In fact, God is to the universe what a band is to music. If a band were up here playing music, the band would be playing and sustaining the music. What would happen to the band the second the music stopped playing? Music would be over, right? Same thing is true with God. God creates the universe and the natural laws that govern it, and he creates you, and he sustains the universe and the natural laws that govern it, and he sustains you. This is a sustaining cause. This is why Paul could come along and say, in Jesus we live and move and have our being. And Christ holds all things together. And the writer of Hebrews says, God sustains all things by his powerful word. Now, if you want more on that, that book over there called Stealing from God gets into it. But we got to move on to our third argument. And this is the argument from morality. And probably the easiest way of 
showing you the argument here is to ask you this question. How do you know that your quarterback throwing a touchdown is better than your quarterback throwing a pick six? That's when he throws the ball to the other team and they take it back for a touchdown for themselves. How do you know? How do you know a touchdown is better than a pick six? Anyone? Not just rules. Going the right direction, you're getting there. You've got to know the purpose of the game, right? If you don't know the purpose of the game, you can't say that this touchdown is getting, getting us closer to the purpose and this pick six is taking us further away. Without a purpose, you wouldn't be able to know one play was better than another, okay? And the same thing is true in life. You've got to know the purpose of life to know this is the moral right way to live life and this is the wrong way to live life. Now, check this out, that the purpose of the game comes from outside the game. When the Eagles and the uh, Chiefs played the Super Bowl a month or two ago, when they showed up to play in Arizona, the field was already set up, the rules were already established, the refs were there, right? They didn't make up the rules. Where did the rules came for, come from? They came from outside the game. The commissioner, the owners, they decided what the rules were. Now, the rules in football are arbitrary. They could be different, but the rules in life are not arbitrary. They come from outside the game, the creator, yet they're rules that we ought to obey because he gives us the purpose. If there is no God, then nothing is ultimately right or wrong. In fact, if there is no God, the Nazis were not wrong. That's just your opinion against the Nazis. If there is no God, love is no better than rape. Oh, you just might like love better, obviously, but it's just your preference. If there is no God, there are no human rights. And in our culture, we seem to be inventing rights every 10 minutes, aren't we? But without God, there are no rights. There's not only no right to abortion, there's no right to life. There's not only no right to same-sex marriage, there's no right to natural marriage. There's no rights to anything if there is no God. It's just one person's opinion against another. If there is no God, then murder, slavery, and racism are not wrong. But we all know they are wrong. So God must exist. Religious people have never done anything wrong unless God exists. You see, if you're a religious person and somebody accuses you, say, of being a hypocrite, you might ask them, you know what? Let me agree with you, I am a hypocrite, but why would it be in a hypocrite be wrong? If there's no God, that's just your opinion. In fact, John Dixon, a historian from down under, asked this question, or says you ought to ask this question. And before I tell you what the question is, let me ask you guys a question. How many people in this room know somebody who's not a Christian because Christians have been jerks to them? Can I see your hands, please? Yeah, all of us probably raised their hand. Yeah, we know somebody like that. Here's the question you ought to, ought to ask to, of that person. When someone plays Beethoven poorly, who do you blame? You don't blame Beethoven. You blame the player. So when someone plays Jesus poorly, you don't blame Jesus. Look, just because I'm not true and beautiful doesn't mean Jesus isn't true and beautiful. Newsflash, Christianity is not Christians, Christianity is Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. In fact, if we were perfect, we wouldn't need a savior. So always ask people. When somebody plays Beethoven poorly, who do you blame? You don't blame Beethoven. When somebody plays Jesus poorly, you don't blame Jesus. And if there is no God, tolerance is no better than intolerance. It's just your opinion. By the way, are Christians commanded to be tolerant? No, Christians are commanding to, commanded to love. See, there's a difference. Tolerance says hold your nose and put up with them. Love says reach out and help them. Tolerance is too weak. We're supposed to love people. But love doesn't mean you approve of everything they do. How many people in here have children? How many people in here are parents, in other words? Okay. How many people in here are former children themselves? Okay, good. That's all of us, all right? Let me ask you a question. If your parents tolerated everything you wanted to do as a child, would they have been loving parents? No. no, you need to stand in the way of evil if you're gonna love somebody. You just can't let people do what they wanna do if it's gonna hurt them or others. You would be an enabler. You wouldn't be someone who loved them. 
You've got to stand in the way of evil. That's what love does. The great economist who's now 92 years old, his name is Thomas Sowell, who grew up in Harlem, but then went on to teach at some of the best universities in the world, said this, when you tell people what they need to hear, you're helping them. When you tell people what they want to hear, you're helping yourself. Why don't we tell people we love what they really need to hear? Because we don't want them mad at us. You know what we're doing? We're not helping them. We're helping ourselves because we don't want them mad at us. If we truly love people, we'll tell them tactfully what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And if there is no God, you can't complain about the problem of evil. A lot of people say there can't be a good God because there's too much evil in the world. Exactly the opposite's true. If there's evil in the world, God exists. You say, well, how can that be? Well, C.S. Lewis was a veteran of World War I, and after he came out of World War I where he saw, he, saw, he saw his own friend killed, he said there can't be a good God. There's too much injustice in the world. Then one day he realized the argument didn't work. And he wrote it in the book, Mere Christianity. If you haven't read Mere Christianity, whether you're a Christian or not, you ought to read the book. It's a classic. Here's what Lewis said about injustice being in the world. He said, as an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how would I got this idea of, of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? You see, you wouldn't know what a crooked line was unless you knew what a straight line was. You wouldn't know what injustice was unless you knew what justice was. Something can't be not right unless something is right. In other words, there's got to be a standard. The question is, what is that standard? The standard is God's nature. If God doesn't exist, there's nothing good, which means there's nothing evil. Because what is evil? Evil is a lack in a good thing. It's a privation in a good thing. It's a parasite in a good thing. Evil doesn't exist on its own. Let me give you an example. Evil is like cancer. If you take all the cancer out of a good body, you've got a better body. What happens if you take all the body out of the cancer? you got nothing. can't exist unless there's a good thing to exist in. Evil is like rust in a car. If you take all the rust out of a car, you've got a better car. What happens if you take all the car out of the rust? You got a pinto. Come on. Some of you are old enough to remember the pinto. Evil is like a moth-eaten garment, right? You have holes in the garment. What's a completely moth-eaten garment? It's nothing. There's nothing left, right? Evil can only exist as a lack in a good thing. So if there's evil, and we all know there is, then there has to be a standard of good, and that good is what we mean by God's nature. In fact, we could put it this way. The shadows prove the sunshine. In order to have shadows, you've got to have sunshine. In other words, in order to have evil, you have to have good. Oh, you can have sunshine without shadows. You can have good without evil, but you can't have shadows without sunshine. You can't have evil without good. So if evil exists, again, this sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. If evil exists, God exists. Not because God is doing evil, but because he's the standard of good that would allow us to even know what evil was. So evil doesn't disprove God. It may prove there's a devil out there, but it can't disprove God. Now, we can talk during the Q&A if you want as to why God allows certain evils. That's another question. But there would be no such thing as evil unless there was good, and there'd be no such thing as good unless God existed. So Christopher Hitchens, do you guys remember who Christopher Hitchens was? He was a brilliant British atheist who sounded more brilliant than he was because he had a British accent. And I had a couple of debates with him. This is actually a picture from our second debate. You can see the debates on our YouTube channel for free. Anyway, he says, God is not great how religion poisons everything. Actually, he gets this backwards. Religion doesn't poison everything. Everything poisons religion. In fact, in the second debate with him, I said, Christopher, a lot of what you say in your book is correct. Religious people have done evil things. But there would be no evil unless there was good, and there'd be no such thing as good unless God existed. So you're proving our worldview that there is a God out there when you cite all these evil things. And I said, Christopher, I'm a hypocrite. I can't live up to what Jesus told me to live up to. But if I could, I wouldn't need him. I wouldn't need him as a savior. In fact, I said, when people say I can't go to church because there's too many hypocrites down there, I always say, come on down, pal, we got room for one more. 
The church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a country club for saints. We're all fallen. So, there's so much more in the books on that argument, but let's just sum up these three arguments. From the cosmological argument, we can see that the first cause is spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, and intelligent. From the teleological argument, we can also see there's more evidence this being is intelligent, and this being also sustains the universe. From the moral argument, we can also see that this being is moral. There's a character, there's righteousness, justice, love to it. So think about this, ladies and gentlemen. From these three arguments, we have a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator who created and sustains all things. This is the God of biblical Christianity, and we haven't even opened the Bible yet. Do you see what I mean, how you can show that God exists without any reference to any religious work? Because this is known as natural theology. We're just looking at cause and effect here. And we realize there's got to be a cause with these attributes. Now the question is, is this Allah? Is this Jesus? Is this some other theistic God we don't know about? How are we going to learn? How are we going to discover? For that, we got to go to the third question, are miracles possible? And you're probably going, Frank, you're going to run out of time here. No, this one goes quickly, all right? Are miracles possible? And miracles can be used to show that someone speaks for God. In the Bible, this is the way it worked. Moses could do miracles, so people would say, well, Moses has new revelation because God is confirming him. Elijah and Elijah had new revelation, so miracles were poured out on them. Jesus and the apostles had new revelation, so miracles were poured out on them. That's how the people could understand that these people speak for God. Here's the problem, though. Particularly in our culture, many people think miracles are impossible. For example, Noah. All right, Christians, if you're a Christian in here, can we just agree on one thing? Noah and the ark is crazy. Also, resurrections. I already asked you, how many of you have seen a resurrection? None of us have. Yet to be a Christian, you've got to believe something none of us have ever seen. And probably the biggest problem miracle in the Bible is Jonah. Is that a tale of a whale or a whale of a tale? What is the deal with Jonah? Can you actually believe in Jonah? Well, what is the greatest miracle in the Bible? It's not the resurrection. The greatest miracle in the Bible is... The first verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible, right? I mean, if God can create the universe out of nothing, then he can do whatever he wants. It's not logically impossible inside the universe. And here's the interesting thing. Even the atheists are admitting the evidence for this. Again, they don't think it's God, but if space, time, and matter literally had a beginning, who else could it have been? other than a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent creator. Because if Genesis 1-1 is true, are these other miracles possible? Of course Noah's crazy, unless God exists. Of course resurrections don't happen, unless God exists. Of course Jonah's a fairy tale, unless God exists. Now, I know a lot of people don't believe in miracles because they've never seen one. That's not a good reason to disbelieve something. Why? Because you believe in a lot of things you've never seen. You believe in your mind. Have you ever seen it? No, you're using it right now. You believe in the laws of logic, the laws of mathematics. Have you ever seen those? No, you're using them right now. You believe in justice. Have you ever seen justice? No, you may have seen people treated justly or unjustly, but you don't see it directly because it's an immaterial reality grounded in the nature of God. It's an act, not something you see. You believe in love. Everyone believes in love. Have you ever seen it? You may have seen it demonstrated, but you've never seen it in itself. In fact, in the second debate with Christopher Hitchens, some kid at the College of New Jersey during the Q&A asked Christopher this question. Christopher, what is love? And Hitchens being a materialist, thinking that everything's made of molecules, you know what he said? He said, love is a chemical. And I said, don't tell that to your wife. Love is a chemical. Honey, do you love me? Yeah, why? Because I got the chemical today. You know, tomorrow I might not have it. No, love is not a chemical. It's an immaterial virtue grounded in the nature of God. Supercalifragilistic expialidocious. 
She's doing it. Look at that. That's amazing. You're really good. Round of applause back there for the sign language. By the way, you've never seen gravity. Oh, Frank, sure I have. There it is right there. No, you're not seeing gravity. What are you seeing? You're seeing the effects of gravity. This is how we know God exists, ladies and gentlemen. If someone asks you, how do you know God exists, here's what I think you ought to say. I believe God exists because of the law of cause and effect. I know God by his effects, in other words. What's an effect? Creation. So you're reasoning back to a cause, a creator. Design is an effect. So you're reasoning back to a cause, a designer. A moral law written on your heart, an effect. You're reasoning back to a cause, a moral law giver. The ability to think rationally, to access these laws of logic, that's the effect. So you're reasoning back to a cause of mind. You look at the evidence that a man claimed to be God and predicted and accomplished his own resurrection from the dead. That's the effect. So you're reasoning back to a cause. Who could raise somebody from the dead but God himself? In other words, you're always reasoning from effect back to cause. This is what scientists do. Scientists are looking for causes of effects. In fact, if you think you have a personal experience with God or you've had a personal experience with God, you're doing the same thing. This personal experience you're interpreting as an effect from a cause known as God. So you're always reasoning from effect back to cause. You've never seen George Washington, yet you believe he existed. Why? Because he's left effects behind that are best explained by a man who lived from 1732 to 1799 named George Washington. You've never seen Jesus physically, but you believe he existed. Why? Because he's left effects behind that are best explained by Jesus of Nazareth. Now, if miracles occur, and they don't need to occur in modern times for Christianity to be true. There could be no miracles since Jesus and the apostles and Christianity would still be true. I think there have been miracles since then, but that's not the point. If miracles do occur, you say, why don't we see them today? Even if they occur today, you ought not expect to see many of them. Why? Because miracles, by definition, have to be rare if they're going to get our attention. If miracles occurred routinely, they wouldn't get our attention as special acts from God. I mean, imagine if people rose from the dead routinely. What would the resurrection of Christ mean to us? Nothing. You go to somebody and you go, Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God. And the guy goes, so what? Uncle George just rose from the dead two weeks ago. Now I got to give the inheritance back. No, it's got to be a rare event. It can't be a regular event. The only way you can detect a miracle is against the backdrop of regular events. So even if they occur, you ought not expect to see many of them. But there are things that occur every day. Every day, and since they occur every day, we don't call them miracles, but we probably should because they are so amazing. How many people in here have ever seen your own flesh and blood born? Every mother should raise your hand and every father who was there, right? Now, when you see another living human being come out of another human being, you don't go, evolution, right? You go, this is amazing. There's intelligence behind this. We don't call it a miracle because it occurs every day, but we know there's, we know there's intelligence behind it. All right, so miracles are possible. If Genesis 1-1 is true, every other verse is at least possible. Now let's see if the New Testament is reliable enough for us to detect whether one more miracle at least took place, and that is the resurrection of Jesus. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, game over, Christianity is true. Now, what evidence do we have that New Testament writers are telling the truth? In the book, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, and the other book too, Stealing from God, which is over there, um, we have more than 10 reasons why the New Testament writers are telling the truth. We don't have time to go through that tonight. We've got to get to your questions. So we're just going to look at two of them. And the first one we're going to look at is something called embarrassing stories. What are embarrassing stories? Historians know if there's something embarrassing to the author or authors of a given text, it's probably true. Why would it be true? Because you're not going to invent things that make you look bad. You're not going to invent things that embarrass you. You might invent things that make you look good, but not bad, right? In fact, how many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look good? If you don't have your hand up right now, you're lying to make yourself look good. And it's not working. We know you're lying. 
All right, how many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look bad? No, you don't do that. You might lie to make yourself look good, but not bad. Well, the New Testament writers have filled the New Testament with embarrassing stories they never would have invented. It makes them look bad. So they're telling the truth. That's why we call this the dove factor. Let me just give you a few of this, a few of these. Peter, the leader of the disciples, is called Satan by Jesus. Do you think they invented this? Do you think Mark, who wrote this down at one point, said to Peter, Hey, Pete, I'm going to make this a real interesting story. I'm going to have the Lord call you Satan. What do you think Peter would have said? Have him call you Satan. This is embarrassing. I shouldn't be called Satan. And then uh, Peter says, Lord, I'll never deny you. What does he wind up doing? He denies him three times. And then at the crucifixion, all the disciples, maybe with the exception of one, they all run away. This is like a Monty Python movie, right? Like, run away. And who are the brave ones? Who are the brave ones? Ladies, who are the brave ones? The women. The women are the brave ones. Now, who wrote this down? Men. Now, what man <laughs> is going to invent that he was hiding for fear of the Jews why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb? Would any man in here invent that? No, if I was inventing it, I'd make myself look good, wouldn't you? I'd write down, let's see, we marched right down there and we overpowered that elite Roman guard. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. John said, get out. Peter, roundhouse kicked him. Thomas said, we'll be back. <laughs> no doubt. And then on Sunday morning, we marched right down to the tomb and we saw Jesus who congratulated us on our great faith. And then we went, then we went and comforted the trembling women. I would never say I was Mr. Sissy Pants why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb. And oh, by the way, why would you never say the women were the first witnesses in that culture? Forget about the fact it was embarrassing to men. Independent of that, why would you never say that? Because a woman's testimony was not considered on par with that of a man. So if you're making up the New Testament story, you'd only have the men be the first witnesses. Yet all four Gospels say the women were the first witnesses, which is telling us what? They were! And one of them was a formerly demon-possessed woman. Gee, what a credible witness you got there, huh? They're not making this up. I actually had a lady come up to me once. She said, Frank, I know why Jesus appeared to the women first. And I said, why? And she said, because he wanted to get the story out. <laughs> I said, that is an excellent point. I had not thought of that. Because ladies, when your man comes home from work, does he say much? There could have been a nuclear explosion down at the plant. He's not going to tell you. You'll see it on the news before you hear it from him. You'll be watching the news going, hey, hon, what? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. The nuke blew up. I've been hot for three days. What's for dinner? He's not going to tell you. I can't even believe this next verse is in the Bible, but it is. This is uh, the Great Commission. This is Matthew 28, 17. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus gives them the Great Commission where he says, go therefore make disciples of all nations. You know that passage there? And Jesus has his disciples up on a mountain in Galilee. This is, the, this is the climax of the whole gospel. And he's standing there giving them the Great Commission. And in verse 17, it says of the disciples who are there, some believed, but some doubted. What? He's standing resurrected right in front of them. And they're doubting. It's like they're standing there going, you see that guy over there? Yeah, that guy over there is Jesus. Oh, no, it can't be Jesus. He was just killed not long ago. No, I'm telling you, it's him. Look, Jesus is dead. It can't be him. It's him. Look, the Romans killed him. They put spears in him. They, they nailed him to a cross. They whipped him. He's dead. No, it's him. It can't be. It is. How do you know? The women told me. They're not making this up. There's even potentially embarrassing details about Jesus in there. Jesus is called a drunkard. He's called demon-possessed. Do you think they invented that? He's called a madman. His own family doesn't believe in him. His own family thinks he's out of his mind, Mark chapter 3. They want to seize him and take him home. And there are two prostitutes in his bloodline. Do you think they made this up? Do you think Matthew and Luke said, you know, we really ought to spice up the Messiah's bloodline a little bit. Let's put a couple of prostitutes in here, Rahab, Tamar. No. 
They're just telling the truth. In fact, there's a lot of shady people in the bloodline. Who are, the, who are some of the shady people in the Messiah's bloodline? Judah, from where we get the term Jew from, tribe of Judah. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. Judah, not a good guy. What did Judah do? He sold his brother, Joseph, into slavery in Egypt, and yet he's in the bloodline of the Messiah. David, David, a man after God's own heart. Yeah, but he's a liar, adulterer, and a murderer. Gee, I guess there's hope for the rest of us then. Bathsheba's in there. In fact, when Matthew gets to Bathsheba in the genealogy, he won't even mention her name. Do you know what he says? He says, Uriah's wife. Ooh. He's telling the truth, but it's a slam. Why? Who's Uriah? Uriah is the husband of Bathsheba, whom David had killed to cover up his sin. And then Jesus is hung on a tree. You'd never do that if you're making up the Messiah to the Jews. Why? Because according to Deuteronomy 21, 23, anyone who's hung on a tree is under God's curse. Jesus was under God's curse. What curse? The curse of sin we all put him under. In fact, what are the two trees in, in, the, in the book of Genesis, in the beginning? Anyone know? What are the two? Tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Go all the way to the end of the Bible, book of Revelation. What's the tree you see here? Tree of life again. You know there's a tree in the middle? What's the tree in the middle? That's the tree they hung Jesus on. Because we sinned at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the only way we're, we're again going to get access to the tree of life is if Jesus is sacrificed in our place on a tree. You see, the Bible is very symmetrical. It starts with two trees, and it ends with a tree. It starts with a wedding, it ends with a wedding. And it's written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years, and yet it tells one unifying story. There's a lot more embarrassing details, particularly in the uh, Stealing from God book. We've got to do one more, and that is, in addition to embarrassing stories, excruciating deaths. Let me ask the question, what did the New Testament writers have to gain by making up a new religion? What did they get? Killed. Yeah, they got beaten, tortured, and killed. Remember, these people were all Jews. They thought they were God's chosen people. Why would they invent a resurrected Jesus? For saying Jesus had risen from the dead, they got kicked out of the synagogue, then they got beaten, tortured, and killed. Last time I checked, it was not a list of perks. Right? We're going to start a new religion. We are? Yeah, what's it going to get us? First we'll get kicked out of the synagogue, then we'll get beaten, tortured, and killed. Well, sign me up! No, <laughs> nobody's doing this, right? And then the next question, they had every motive to say the resurrection did not happen, not every motive to say it did. You know, I get the question a lot. Maybe you do if you're a Christian. Are there any non-Christian writers that talk about Jesus and the apostles? Yeah, there are. There's, they're all listed in chapter 10 or chapter 9 of I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. But they're not eyewitnesses. However, you know what's kind of underneath the question when they ask you about non-Christian writers? People are thinking, you know, you really can't trust the New Testament writers because they were biased. They had an agenda. You can only trust the secular writers or non-Christian writers. If you think about that for more than five seconds, you realize how stupid that is. What did these people have to gain by saying it was true? Nothing. There's two things they didn't believe as Jews. They didn't believe a man could claim to be God, that was blasphemy, and they didn't think that someone would rise from the dead in the middle of time. They knew we'd all rise from the dead at the end of time, according to Daniel 12, but they didn't think a man could claim to be God and rise from the dead. And what do they wind up saying? A man actually claimed to be God and rose from the dead. They're not making this up. They had every motive to say this didn't happen, not every motive to say it did. And then why would they die for a known lie? Time out, Frank. If you're going to say that martyrdom provides evidence for Christianity, don't you have to say it provides evidence for Islam? Because you have Muslim martyrs. And the answer is no. Why? Because there's a lot of differences between the Muslim martyrs of today and the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times. But let me just give you one main difference for our purposes. The Muslim martyrs of today haven't witnessed anything that tells them that Islam is true. They just have faith. But the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times witnessed Jesus rise from the dead. They saw Jesus. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They verified with their own senses that Jesus had risen from the dead. Many people, or at least some people, will die for a lie they think is the truth. Nobody will die for a lie they know is a lie. 
And the New Testament apostles were in a position to know whether it was a lie or not, and they went to their deaths anyway. You can't get better evidence than that unless you were there yourself. All right, the last thing I'm going to say on this, and it's going to sound like heresy for those of you that believe the Bible is inerrant like I do, but it's not. Just stick with me. Christianity is not true because a series of documents we put under one binding we call the Bible says it's true. In fact, Christianity would be true if the Bible never existed. You say, how can that be? Do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? Why? Because they witnessed the resurrected Jesus, not because they read a book. Why was Paul a Christian? Because he witnessed the resurrected Jesus. Then he wrote the books. Why was John a Christian and Matthew and Mark and Luke? Because they witnessed. Well, Luke wasn't an eyewitness, but John was, Matthew was, because they saw the resurrected Jesus. In other words, Christianity did not originate with a book. Christianity originated with an event, the resurrection. There would be no series of books written by Jews in the first century claiming a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead unless a man actually did claim to be God and actually did rise from the dead. In fact, we could say it this way. The New Testament writers did not create the resurrection the resurrection created the New Testament writers. You wouldn't have these people claiming that Jesus rose from the dead unless he really did. Now, thankfully, they did write it down so we could know about it and orient our lives according to it, but it would have been true if it had never been written down because that's how Christianity began. Now, there are many other reasons to believe the New Testament writers are telling the truth. Here's just a few of them. We just looked at the first two. There's also early sources, eyewitness details, embedded confirmation, expected predictions. That's Old Testament prophecy. Extra biblical writers, the explosive growth of the church out of Jerusalem, which is really hard to explain because Christianity could have been stopped if somebody took Jesus' body out of the tomb and everyone knew where the tomb was. They couldn't do that because Jesus was still using his body. What's the overall argument? Does truth exist? Does God exist? Are miracles possible? Is the New Testament true? Does truth exist? Somebody says there's no truth, what are you going to say? Is that true? Does God exist? First argument, what? Cosmological. Second argument, teleological. Third argument, moral argument. From those three arguments, spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, moral, intelligent creator who created all things and sustains all things. Are miracles possible? If God exists, miracles are possible. What's the greatest miracle in the Bible? Genesis 1.1. If Genesis 1.1 is true, every other verse is at least possible. Even atheists are admitting the evidence for Genesis 1.1. Is Jesus, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Seems he has. I just showed you a couple lines of evidence. There's many more. We talk about embarrassing and excruciating deaths. Now, if you want to go further, the books are available on the book table, and I want to point out that all the proceeds and the sale of the books are going to go feed needy children. Mine, okay, just so you know. I don't want to, I don't want to take those home to Charlotte tomorrow, so start buying them now. You've got uh, about uh, 300 days till uh, Christmas, so there you go. If you don't want to buy a book, that's fine. You can text this word evidence to this phone number, 855-909-0582. If you do that, I'm going to send you the entire PowerPoint presentation, not just what I showed you here, all of the slides. There's 360 of them. I showed you maybe 50 or 60 tonight. And uh, if you just text the word evidence to that phone number, I'm going to send you, to, uh, send you the entire PowerPoint presentation in a PDF format. And I'm also going to sh send you about five other presentations as well. So just text that word evidence. This book is on the book table as well as that. We ran out of DVDs at the church the other day, but you can get all that at our website, crossexamine.org, if you want to go further. Okay, last thing before questions. It's true. So what? So what if Christianity's true? Well, the best news of all, someone actually did die for you. Now, years ago, I was in the Navy, which stands for Never Again Volunteer Yourself. Anyway, I was in naval aviation, and we had to earn golden wings, which were fairly hard to earn, but there's nothing more difficult in the Navy to earn than a golden trident. Very few people that start SEAL training actually finish, maybe 
Those that do complete SEAL training wear that golden trident with pride. It is their military identity. When Michael Monsor was buried in Rosecrans Cemetery in San Diego, California, just about every Navy SEAL on the West Coast showed up for his funeral. And when they showed up and passed his casket, they took off their tridents and they pressed them into his casket. They took their identity and put their identity in the one that sacrificed for them, the one that died for them. That's what we're supposed to do. But our culture says, oh no, put your identity in your political party, or put your identity in your gender, or put your identity in your sexual orientation, or put your identity in your bank account, or your vocation, or, your, or even your church. No, you're supposed to put your identity in your savior. All of the other identities you have to achieve. In Christianity, you don't achieve your identity, you receive your identity. If you have to achieve your identity, all the pressure's on you, and there's always someone that can do it better. What happens if you put your identity in another person, and then they die, or they leave you? You no longer have an identity? What happens if you put your identity in your sexual orientation, and then you can't perform sexually at some point? You no longer have an identity? What happens if you put your identity in your job, and you lose your job? You no longer have an identity? No, your identity is not in temporal fleeting things. Your identity is in your Savior. He achieved it for you. All you do is receive it. And then one day you'll be resurrected like he was resurrected. You know, you can lose everything in this life. You can lose your spouse. You can lose your money. You can lose your job. You can lose your abilities. You can lose your health. You're ultimately going to lose your life. The only thing you can't lose is your Savior. John, who was a biographer of Jesus, we call him the Apostle John, wrote in the very first chapter of his biography, God has given you the right to become a child of God. How do you become a child of God? You simply receive what he already achieved, and that's eternal. Why wouldn't you accept it? It's free. And you're not only forgiven, you're given his righteousness. All right. With that being said, we're going to go to questions. And the great Clint Bolin here has a microphone set up over here because people are watching on the internet. So if you have a question, all you need to do is go up to the mic there. And since no one likes to ask the first question, we're going to move right on to the second question. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Ah, very good question. She asks, can you spell supercalifragilisticexpialidocious? We're at about out of time right now, so <laughs> out of time. No, nope, can't do it. But you did, because I saw you do it. <laughs> All right, so anyone have any questions? You can, we can talk about anything we talked about, or we could talk about other stuff, too. It's up to you. If you have questions on other topics, I'll, I'll be sure to try and evade your question. All right, so... Um, so go ahead. Anyone have a question? Otherwise, it's going to be short. It's going to be a very short night. Don't make me start telling jokes up here. Come on, somebody has to have a question. So a new father was playing peekaboo with his little baby, and he had a horrible accident. He wound up in the hospital. He's in ICU now. Some of you will get that tomorrow. Come on. Come on, no questions from the University of Vermont, please. All right, you mind going to the mic so everyone can hear? Yes, sir. Here he is. Give him a hand, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, there he is. What's your name, sir? My name's Kevin. Kevin, go ahead, sir. So earlier you said Christianity isn't Christians, Christianity is Jesus. Yes. And I think you did a great job logically presenting the two for Christianity, which is Jesus, your New Testament, your creation, miracles, all of that. 
Um, but when we go to the original politics, so if we would go back to a Cyprian or a Tertullian or Justin, uh, they tend to put a lot of emphasis on the moral uh, nature of how the disciples and early Christians are acting. But you seem mm. to glance over that. Is there a reason for that? I'm just trying to understand a bit more. That they had a moral transformation, you're saying? Right, yeah, because that yeah. was the evidence for, you know, you talk about the explosive yes. growth as one of the big um, factors of the New Testament being true, right? Yes. Um, and the reason for that is because of the, the moral transformation of the disciples in their lives. Well, I think the reason they did have a moral transformation was because of the resurrected Jesus. Sure. It wasn't just, wow, we like Jesus, so we're going to try and follow him. In fact, as you know, they all ran away and were scared, scattered, and skeptical until the resurrection occurred, and then they became the greatest peaceful missionary force in the history of the world, ultimately took over the Roman Empire. So there was a moral transformation, and I'm not denying that we ought to have a moral transformation. All I'm saying is that none of us are going to be perfect this side of eternity. And so if somebody who claims to be a Christian has somehow wronged you, that's not a reason for you to say, well, Christianity's false. I'm going to stay out of the kingdom. Because Christianity doesn't promise everyone's going to be perfect here. In fact, the Apostle Paul himself, as you know, in Romans chapter 7 says, what a wretched man that I am. What I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, I do. Who's going to save me from this body of death? And it's Jesus who's going to save him. So even the Apostle Paul struggled with sin. We're all struggling with sin. But that ought not be an excuse for other people to say, look, Christianity's false. No, Christianity predicts we still have this sin nature. But it promises that one day the sin nature will be eradicated because of what Christ has done on the cross. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's good. All right. Good, Kevin. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Come on, somebody follow Kevin. Usually when one person starts, then other people go. So let's do it. I don't know if we have any questions from the, uh, the YouTube crowd, do we, Clint? Can you see if we do? Because we can take questions from, from the, uh, the YouTube audience out there as well. Yes, microphone right over here, if you don't mind coming right over here, because then the people on the internet can actually hear. But if you got one there, Clint, go ahead and we'll... Okay, working on it, all right. All right, yeah, we may take a few from online too. Yes, ma'am, what's your name? I'm just, my name's Melissa. I'm just curious for people you're talking to who are like... Melissa, if you would, just get a little closer to the microphone. Sure, just curious for people that you talk to who like physical evidence like, yeah i'm curious i've like heard uh is there anything that you can talk about like things like i've heard like that there has been no copies of ancient texts that have we have found more than the bible or like yes things I, like mm -hmm. we have there's like been stories that have told the same things like rock of gilgamesh i don't know if you could comment on that type of thing there are many physical leftovers if you will uh that pertain to the Christian faith. One of them, of course, is the manuscript evidence. And I'll see if I have a slide on that because that's a very interesting question. How do we know what the original said? And um, like, for example, uh, we don't have the original copy of, say, the Book of Romans or any New Testament book. But we have our bunch of copies. And you say, well, how do we, dis how do we discover what the original say, Book of Romans or Book of John or any book in the New Testament said, what you do is you compare the copies. And let's say every one of these copies has an error, but it just has an error in, the, in a different place. Is there a way for us to reconstruct what the original said by looking at these four different copies? Yeah, we can, with 100% accuracy, figure out that this is actually uh, Romans 3.26, God is the, uh, just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus by comparing these different copies. Now, there's over 5,000 handwritten Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Some of them from the second century all the way to the time of the printing press. Some of them are just small fragments of the New Testament, like the oldest one is called the John Rylands fragment. It comes from the early second century. It's maybe about that big. It's just a little section of John 18. But you get complete New Testaments by the 300s A.D. And even people like Bart Ehrman, who is a uh, 
manuscript uh, expert says this, and he's an atheist or um, he's someone that wrote the book uh, Misquoting Jesus, which got a lot of people wondering if we know what the New Testament originally said. But even he admits we know what the original New Testament said. Here's what he said in the second edition of that book. Bruce Metzger was his mentor is one of the great scholars of modern times, and I dedicated the book to him, the book Misquoting Jesus, because he was both my inspiration for going into textual criticism and the person who trained me in the field. I have nothing but respect and admiration for him. And even though we may not, or we may disagree on important religious questions, he's a firmly committed Christian and I am not. We are in complete agreement on a number of very important historical and textual questions. He goes on to say, if Metzger and I were put in a room and asked to hammer out a consensus statement on what we think the original New Testament or the text of the New Testament probably looked like, there would be very few points of disagreement, maybe one or two dozen out of many thousands. The position I argue for in misquoting Jesus does not actually stand at odds with Professor Metzger's position that the essential beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. So my question for, for Dr. Ehrman would be, why did you even write the book then? Because, you know, misquoting Jesus got people worried that, oh, we don't know what the original said, when in fact you're admitting we do know essentially what the original said. So there's manuscript evidence, there's archeological evidence, Melissa. Um, in fact, we have archeological evidence of John the Baptist. We have archeological, or written evidence anyway, of John the Baptist. We have archeological evidence of Caiaphas, the high priest, who sentenced Jesus to die. In fact, let me see if I have a picture of that because that is one of the most fantastic discoveries, I think, of all time, that uh, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that sentenced Jesus to die, we found his burial box, which is something known as an ossuary. An ossuary is a burial box that the Jews used from about 20 B.C. to about, uh, say, uh, about uh, 70 A.D., and hang on, I just got to find the right slide here. And that burial box, if I have it, uh, stand by for vectors, Victor, I'm finding it. Call for clearance, Clarence. Roger, Roger. Do we have any airplane fans in here? here here's the burial box of Caiaphas. This was discovered in 1990 in Jerusalem. And as you can see, it's very ornate. And on the side of this box, it actually shows the burial or the uh, inscription that says uh, Joseph Caiaphas. There's only one Caiaphas known from history, and it's the guy that sentenced Jesus to die. Not only do we have his bones, we have the burial box in which his bones were interred. We also have the bones of his granddaughter in another ossuary. And we have a, another ossuary that apparently is the ossuary of James, the half-brother of Jesus, because on the side of that ossuary it said, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And they thought that was a forgery for several years, and then they did tests on it, and they realized it does not appear to be a forgery. It appears to be authentic. We also know that, that Pilate existed. Uh, in fact, let me see if I can find the Pilate ossuary. And it's not the uh, Pilate inscription, not an ossuary, which shows you that Pilate, this was found in the coast. Identified Pilate the prefect of Judea. This was found in 1961. Uh, there are all sorts of different archaeological discoveries. In fact, we're going to Israel in, in November again, and the guide that uh, we use when we go to Israel is a guy by the name of Eli Shukran. Eli Shukran is the Israeli archaeologist that excavated most of the city of David. That was Jerusalem in David's day. And he discovered the Pool of Siloam as well. Remember where Jesus heals the blind man, tells him to go bathe in the Pool of Siloam? Eli Shukran discovered that in 2004. And in fact, the discovery or the excavation has just started to continue again just in the past few months. So the whole Pool of Siloam is now being exposed. So we're going to go to Israel. We just have a few seats left. Any of us want to go, you can. 
uh, you can just go to our website, crossexamine.org, click on events, you'll see the, uh, the trip we're going on in November. Anyone else have a question? If you don't mind, sir, we gotta, we gotta go to the microphone, otherwise uh, no one else is gonna hear us. And this gentleman's gonna go first. And, you know, come on up, come on up, it's fine. Just, it'd be better to stand behind him anyway, that way we, we won't um, have to wait for the next question. Yes, sir, what's your name? My name is Michael. Yes, sir. I'm from Plattsburgh. Yes, right across the Lake Champlain, right? Yeah, I'm blind. Yes, sir. And uh, one of the questions I have, there have been several examples of blindness being cured in the Bible. Yes, sir. And I wonder, it seems so easy. In one example, mud was placed on the person who was blind and he was told to wash in the River Jordan. Yes, sir. And he did so, and he was able to see. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that the examples are common examples. They're not t hard or technical. What makes them possible to, then, and yet I, I don't know how to ask this, but is it possible that they happened then and still happen and we just don't know it? Or yes, sir, it's a great question. Um, there is a researcher at Asbury Seminary, his name is Craig Keener, and he actually did so much research that he wound up releasing a two-volume set about modern day miracles, it's 1100 pages. And he says they do occur, but quite obviously they don't occur all the time. Uh, and he, uh, the book is just called Miracles and uh, it's two sets. He just released a smaller version for the general public. The two big volumes actually is more academic and the shorter version is for you and me, people that aren't academics. Uh, but why does God heal sometimes and not other times? That's a question we don't know. In fact, a friend of mine just passed away from pancreatic cancer. His name is Michael Heiser. He was a uh, Old Testament scholar who uh, has written many books in defense of the Bible and the Old Testament in particular. And he had a podcast called the Naked Bible Podcast. And we prayed for Michael for a couple of years with pancreatic cancer, but God chose not to heal him. Right now I have diabetes as well as blindness. And so it's, it's hard, but I, I thank you for the opportunity to attend your presentation tonight. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for coming. And I would continue to pray for healing. Thank you. Yes, sir, what's your name? My name is John. John, go ahead, sir. Do you think that there's more evidence to support uh, a young universe or an old universe? I'm absolutely convinced the universe is at least 61 years old. <laughs> uh, this is something Christians disagree over. Uh, I think the evidence is much better the, old, the universe is old, and I don't think the Bible necessitates a young earth. In fact, I always ask people the question, and the question is, what does the first verse of the Bible say? In the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, when did God create the heavens and the earth? It doesn't say. It doesn't say, right? You say, well, the days. Well, the days don't begin until verse 3. This is verse 1, and it appears the heavens and the earth are already created. In fact, there was no Hebrew word for universe, so heavens and earth, we think, meant the whole show. And the first verse says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the second verse talks about, and the earth is formless and void. The text goes from the whole universe and then zeroes down on the earth. And it starts talking about the earth. So I think if you want to take a very literal view of Genesis, the heavens and the earth are created before the days ever begin. How far back? We don't know. 
And there is a great book on this by John Lennox, an Oxford uh, philosopher, and the book is called Seven Days That Divide the World. And the bottom line for me is this, whether the universe is old or young does not affect the fact that we need a creator, whether it happened thousands of years ago or billions of years ago. You need a creator regardless of how long ago it took. So whether or not the universe is old or young doesn't really matter to Christian theology. What matters is, is that there was a creator and it, you're going to need one billions or thousands of years, doesn't matter. Make sense? Okay. Thank you. Great question, John. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for starting the questions, Kevin. <laughs> yes, ma'am. We have two questions here. Yes, what's your name? This is Dee. Hey, Dean. And I'm going to say the questions. <laughs> okay, you're asking the question. What's yeah. your name? Kelsey. Kelsey, go ahead. Oh, you were there last night, right? I was. Okay, yeah. go ahead, Kelsey. Um, so, with the Big Bang Theory, yeah. something had to be there in the beginning. Right. So, where would those two first potential atoms that collided come from? Okay, uh, good question. The Big Bang, the theory of the Big Bang and the evidence that we see doesn't say there was a dense pellet or there was pre-existing material. It seems to indicate that space, matter, and time came into existence out of nothing, no space, matter, or time. So it wasn't a pre-existing eternal material state that exploded. There was nothing and then the whole material universe came into existence. So the point that I'm trying to make, if that's what the truth is, and it appears to be the truth, what could have created space, time, and matter? Something that's spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, and intelligent. So if there was nothing before, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. how was God there? And how was there something there to explode? OK, great. When we say nothing, we don't mean that God didn't exist. We mean nothing, space, nothing made of space, time, or matter. There was no physical reality. God had to be there. A cause had to be there. When I say there, I'm not even being accurate, because there was no there there. Right? there. God is not a spatial being. So he didn't exist in some kind of pre-existing spatial area. He's a spaceless, timeless, immaterial cause and a personal cause that could decide to create. So when, when space, time, and matter were created, the best evidence seems to say that was the initial creation of what we call space, time, and matter. There was nothing prior to that. And even when I say prior, I'm, I'm implying uh, time, right? But when I'm using the word prior now, I don't mean chronologically prior. I'm going to use a big word here, ontologically prior, meaning being. There was no being prior to uh, the creation of space, time, and matter. No space, no being in space, matter, or time. There was God who had to create or decided to create, but there was no anything extended in space like we would say now. Does that make sense? All right, second question. Go ahead. Um, there's a common quote that people would say that they would rather live in belief and then find out they were wrong than mm. live not believing and then find out that they were wrong <laughs> and there mm -hmm. was something. Mm -hmm. um, so based on that, if we did live like we believed the whole time and found out that there was no heaven and therefore mm -hmm. no hell, mm -hmm. then what would happen after that? Where would we go? What would happen? If there is no afterlife, we would just, it would just be over. We would just go into oblivion. We would cease to exist. This is, it reminds me of Pascal's wager. Pascal would say, if you trust in Christ, you're wagering that, okay, God does exist and Christianity is true and you'll get eternal benefits. If you trust in Christ and it turns out Christianity is false, all you've lost is maybe some fleeting pleasures here that you decided to forego because you're a Christian, but you're not going to know that because you're not going to exist anymore. Right? This is why Pascal said the best thing to do is to put your trust in Christ, even if you're not 100% sure it's real. Because even if he doesn't exist, you're not going to know it. <laughs> if he does exist, you're going to be in bliss. So why wouldn't you take that wager? Does that make sense? 
All right. Thanks, Kelsey and Dean. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. Hey, what's your name? My name is Evan Lamson. Evan, go ahead, sir. Um, so I find that the trying to explain the Trinity can be extremely difficult. Trying to explain what? The Trinity. Yeah, it is extremely difficult. Yeah, I agree. So how would you go about explaining the Trinity? Okay, yeah, good question. Um, and there is no perfect illustration of the Trinity, but I think, I think there are some ways of showing that the Trinity makes sense. And let me just show you the way that I was taught by my mentor, Dr. Norman Geiser. He said, consider a triangle that has uh, three corners. There's, and, and this represents the Trinity. So there's one divine nature, just like there's one triangle, but there are three persons in this divine nature. You have a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. And then the Son also has a human nature, and these two natures don't intermingle. When Jesus was created 2,000 years ago in his human nature, that's when that nature came into existence. But he always existed uh, as a person of the eternal trinity. So God is three persons in one nature. Jesus is one person with two natures. And this solves a lot of problems when you ask a question about Jesus, because people will say, well, how can Jesus be God and not know when he was coming back? You always have to ask two questions when you ask a question about Jesus. Did Jesus know when he was coming back as man? No. Did he know when he was coming back as God? Yes. In fact, Paul even says in Philippians 2, I think it is, that he emptied himself of the, of the privilege of being God so he could be our sacrifice. He, for, he decided not to access his divine nature while he was here on earth most of the time. He gave all that up so he could be our example. But his divine nature still existed. Did Jesus know or did Jesus get hungry as God? No, as man, yes. Did uh, Jesus forget things <laughs> as man, yes, as God, no, right? You could also look at it this way that the Trinity is one what and three who's, but Jesus is one who with two what. So whenever you ask a question about who two, you got to say, what, what are you talking about? You're talking about what one or what two. If you're talking about what one, it's divine what. If you're talking about what two, that's the human what. Is this clear now? <laughs> All right, good. Now, for me, the Trinity actually solves problems rather than creates them. Why? Because let's say God was a purely monotheistic being like Allah. Well, how can Allah be love if there's no one to love prior to creation, prior to creation right? But if God is a trinity, if he's three persons in one divine essence, then there's a lover, a loved one, and a spirit of love. He had love from all eternity. And this is the model for human relationships, too. That, we are the, that the center ought to be God, and then when we come together, say, in a marriage, we have a covenant relationship between, between the husband and the wife, along with God and the community. Uh, so this shows that God is love from all eternity because he doesn't need to create in order to love anything. He had love from all eternity. And he added the human nature because our human nature is fallen and it needs forgiveness and since he's infinitely just, the only way he can allow unjust people like me and you to go unpunished is he punishes an innocent substitute in our place. That's why the emphasis of Christianity is not that Jesus is our example, although he is an example. The emphasis of Christianity is that Jesus is our substitute, that he takes our punishment on himself. And then out of gratitude for what he's done, then we do good works. The good works don't save us. The good works are a evidence that we are saved. As Martin Luther famously put it, you're saved by faith alone, but your faith is not alone. It's accompanied by good works because you're grateful for what Christ has done for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, helps. All right. All right. By the way, the best chapter I think you can read on the Trinity is actually in a book that my co-author, Dr. Norman Geiser, wrote. And it's a book on Islam. It's called Answering Islam. It's written by Norman Geisler and Abdul Salib, who is a former Muslim. 
And the reason they have a great chapter on the Trinity is because Muslims object to the Trinity. But in reality, Islam has something similar, even though they'll deny it. Because in Islam, they think the Quran is eternal, along with God. So there's something eternal that is with God, even though they will claim that you can't put partners with God. You can't put partners with Allah. That would be the sin of shirk, putting partners with Allah. But they do the same thing. They just, their partner is the Quran. So in Islam, God became a book. In Christianity, God added humanity to his deity to come to earth to save us. All right? Okay. All right, great question. But I, I'd, I'd get that book. It's a good book, Answering Islam. Yes, sir, what's your name? Hello, my name is Mike. Mike. Um, I was curious, what are your views on near-death experiences as proof for an afterlife, or is it too much of an unknown? Uh, that's a great question, and the guy who is the expert on it, uh, believe it or not, is also an expert on the resurrection. His name is Gary Habermas. He teaches at Liberty University, and um, if you go to his website, GaryHabermas.com, he has an entire section on what he calls NDEs, near-death experiences. And here's the bottom line to near-death experiences. There's been more than 300 documented near-death veridical experiences. What do I mean by veridical? Not the kind that just say, oh, you know, I, I went to heaven, or this little boy went to heaven and he saw his grandmother and he came back, right? Veridical near-death experiences can be verified. A guy's on an operating table and uh, he flatlines and the doctors bring him back and when he wakes up they say, I just saw an accident on 3rd in Maine. He was over the hospital. And the doctors check it out and they go, there was just an accident on 3rd in Maine. How could he know this? He was on the table the whole time. It's called remote viewing. Those are veridical NDEs, and they can be verified. There are, as I say, about 300 of these. So does this prove Christianity's true? No. But it does. It's another piece of evidence naturalism's fault. What's naturalism? That there is no soul. There's just a body. Because how can some body that's on an operating table witness something that took place, while he's unconscious, that took place several miles away. He wouldn't be able to do that. All right, so uh, those NDEs are further evidence that naturalism's false. Who am I going to trust for what the afterlife is really like? A guy who went there and came back. His name is Jesus. He rose from the dead, and he promised he'll raise us from the dead at the end of time. Anybody that dies now, according to Christianity, if you're a Christian, absent from the body, present with the Lord, at the final resurrection, you're going to be resurrected and your soul's going to be reunited with a physical, imperishable body. And heaven is actually going to be a physical place, a recreated heaven and earth. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. NDEs, near-death experiences. Check out GaryHabermas.com. Plenty up there on that. In fact, I was just at his website today looking at other stuff on the resurrection. Yes, sir, what's your name? Robert. Say, say, I'm sorry? Robert. Robert, go ahead, sir. Um, I watch a, a bunch of uh, Q&A on your channel, but I don't think this question, I, I didn't see it anyway. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, slavery in the uh, uh, Old Testament. Yes. Uh, because it's a, it's a subject that many atheists they, they, they want to, uh, to bring up, you know? <laughs> yes. Uh, so there is a... There's a big difference between the, the slavery in Old Testament and the slavery for the black people. Yes. Because the slavery in the Old Testament was mostly like a uh, like an employee that is yes. not paid but is protected, is nourished, right. and they, they, they could not like uh, be beaten mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. But there's a um, there's one uh, passage in Leviticus. 25. I'm not going to use like the KGV because as a Frenchman, <laughs> okay, it's a bit hard. So I'm getting Go ahead, Robert. the CSB. Okay. What does it so say? So it says you may also purchase them from the aliens, so neighboring countries, uh, residing with you uh, or with the family uh, living among, uh, among you. Those born in your land, they they may become your pro property. They may leave. You may leave them to your son and whatever. Mm -hmm. But it say also. 
But if it's someone from your, um, like an Israelite, you mm -hmm. cannot like beat them up or something like that. It makes almost like uh, the same thing as uh, the black uh, who were like beaten up uh, and uh, they, they, like it says, don't do it to Israelite. Mm -hmm. It make almost like say that you can do it for some for maybe mm -hmm. for aliens. How do you reconcile that? There were privileges for Israelites because in Israel it was a theocracy. <laughs> And so, like, for example, only Israelites could own, own land because you had to be a believer in Yahweh to own land in the Holy Land. So there were certain privileges. But your, your question is good on slavery. I have a lot on the issue of slavery. This is probably the book to get on these issues. Uh, uh, Paul Copan wrote a book, Is God a Moral Monster? Making Sense of the Old Testament God. Let's look at a couple of things. I don't know if it hits on this particular verse in particular. But here's what he says, Israel's servant laws were concerned about controlling or regulating, not idealizing an inferior work arrangement. Israelite servitude was induced by poverty, uh, was, was entered into voluntarily and was far from optimal. The intent of these laws was to combat potential abuses, not institutionalized servitude. Now there was no such thing as welfare, say in ancient Israel or the ancient Near East at all. And so what, since slavery was ubiquitous, it was everywhere, what God was doing was he was regulating slavery. And as you mentioned earlier, Robert, it was more like indentured servitude. That if you're in debt, if, say I'm in debt and I owe you money, the way I could pay you off would be to come work on your farm, work in your household, be given room and board by you, but not uh, be paid but you would take care of me. Yeah. And there was something that would occur after the sixth year, I would be let go whether the, day, whether the debt was paid off or not, or I could choose to become a bond servant. If I wanted to stay with you and you wanted, to stay with, you wanted me to stay with you, Everybody. then I could, yeah, I could have my ear uh, pierced in such a way to illustrate that I was your servant forever. Now, this goes on to say this, property, as you just pointed out, means money. The servant employee came into the master's or employer's house to get out of debt. So the employer stood to lose money if he mistreated his employee. This is why when it says stuff like, well, if he hits the slave and the slave uh, you know, dies or doesn't die, what do you do? It's case law. It would make no sense if you're my master because I owe you money for you to beat me up and kill me because what have you just done? You've just gotten rid of me who owed you something and now I can't pay it off, right? So this is what this case law stuff says. In fact, Copan goes on to say, if then case laws do not promote the behavior cited, but seek to regulate it when it occurs. In other words, you read in the Bible, it says, well, if your donkey falls into a ditch, blah, blah, what do you do? Well, God doesn't want your donkey to fall into a ditch, but if he does, here's how you do it. Or if a man hits another man, what do you do? God doesn't want one man to hit another man, but if it happens, here's how you deal with it. And we have case law all over America, right? If such and such happens, here's how you deal with it. But as Copan points out, there were privileges for being an Israelite that foreigners didn't have. And the same thing, by the way, is true in America. I know this is controversial. However, we have prisoners of war in a place called Gitmo. Why are they prisoners of war? because we had a, a war against terrorism and they don't have the freedoms or even some of the rights that maybe Americans might have. And this was true in the Old Testament. It's still true in our country today that certain prisoners of war can be held um, even without certain rights that would be granted a U.S. citizen. Yeah. All right. Makes sense. Now, I don't know if that hit on your question directly, but that book, Is God a Moral Monster, would be the book yeah, to get. Yeah, that's pretty much the, uh, the, the view that I had. Like, mm -hmm. they, it's like an employee that is not paid, but he's protected in a right. word like regulation from God. Yes. That, that, that doesn't permit to beat them to death. Oh, of course, <laughs> it makes no sense. No, no, no. Yeah. No. But I, I, I was just, just that in the, that verse, I think Leviticus uh, uh, 46 says, but don't treat badly if th that um, that slave, if it's uh, someone from Israel, 
it's almost like don't, normally it should be read like don't beat nobody, like don't right. treat nobody. But why do, why specify that the, the 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 person from Israel should not be beaten beaten to to mistreated? Well, but, actually, they didn't think. If I understand this correctly, and this is not my area of expertise, Leviticus 25, but if, if I understand this correctly, they didn't want it, other Israelites to be taken in servitude. They would find another way to forgive the debt, okay? Because there were privileges that Israelite citizens had that people in the country didn't. But as Copan points out, any other... Um, person in another country around Israel would have fled to Israel and be put under these rules rather than the rules they came from because they had no rights or fewer rights in these other neighboring countries. So this is a great improvement. The other thing we have to point out, and Copan points this out as well, Robert, is the Old Testament law is not the ideal law for all time. No. It is not. It was made for ancient Israel just for that situation. Now, there are principles in it that are uh, universal, like most of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder, you know, commit adultery, these kind of things. But some of the case law and some of this minutia that you get into, not ideal. In fact, Jesus even says it in Matthew chapter 19. Here's what Jesus says about the Old Testament law. He says, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. In other words, he's saying, I wouldn't have permitted divorce as God, but your hearts were so hard that I actually acquiesced. And the same thing is true when it comes to some of these slavery situations, really indentured servitude situations, that God's bringing people along incrementally um, in fact, you know, there's, a, there's a, a parallel to this right now in this country. Uh, we've had Roe v. Wade in place for 49 years, illegitimately argued or decided, but it was the law of the land for 49 years. Now, as soon as it's overturned, notice how abrupt some states, including Vermont, decided to go way in the other direction and say, you can kill your child up to the moment of birth. If we're going to get people to adhere to a pro-life position now, we're going to have to bring them along incrementally. We're not going to be able to just say, well, we've got to ban all abortions um, because people are not going to tolerate that. Just like they wouldn't tolerate a complete uh, ab abolishment of indentured servitude in Old Testament times. Let me give you an example of this. In Florida, Ron DeSantis knew that his state wasn't sufficiently pro-life to ban abortion. So what did he do? He said, okay, we're going to ban abortions after 15 weeks. Okay. Now, hopefully he can work further into that and maybe lower that as people become more and more pro-life. But if he had gone in and said, we're going to ban all abortions, he wouldn't get the votes for that. So what is he going to do? He's going to bring people along incrementally. Yet you see California, Vermont, New York, Massachusetts, some of these states, they're going so far now in the other direction to say, basically, you can't tell us what to do. We're going to, we're going to kill children all the way to the second of birth. That's just depraved. How are you going to bring depraved people along? You're going to have to bring them along incrementally, and that's what God does here. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you All very right. much. Thank you, Robert. Great question, by the way. Great question. All right. Oh, and I say that advisedly, ladies and gentlemen. I'm 100% pro-life. I only think life of the mother is, the, is a justification for abortion because you're not trying to kill a baby. You're trying to save a, a, a mother when you're doing that. Uh, but I think it's better to save some babies than to save none. Right? If we can save some, if we can save them all after 15 weeks, let's do that. If that's the best we can do, let's do that. And then work to educate people at, and point out how people are, how babies are pro-life or are, are human beings from the beginning. Yes, ma'am. Is, is your name Amber? It is. Hey, Amber. Wow, you win. Double right. points for you. <laughs> oh. oh, we're really going. There you go, Amber. Do, there do we super go. Do, do supercalifragilisticexpialidocious for people who couldn't see it on video before. You got it? Go. Like that. that was it? 
How was that it? That was the fastest supercalifragilisticexpialidocious I've ever seen. You talk quickly. <laughs> With my hands and my mouth. That's woo, go. What's up? What do you want to talk about? All right, about? I have a question from my husband. He was uh -huh. there last night. He yes. worked night shift. So he gave me all of his whole list of questions, and I couldn't remember them. So I had him text me. All right, all right, there you go. But I have one. Uh -huh. uh, he has a coworker who doesn't know the Lord. He's been having conversations with. He listens to a lot of your podcasts, actually, and um, has used a lot of different resources. Um, but his coworker brought up the concept of how can our free will and God's foreknowledge exist at the same time? Yeah, uh, people struggle with predestination and free will, and I think the key to understanding that both can exist at the same time is the fact that knowledge does not necessitate causality. What do I mean by that? Um, let's say a, a mother brings home her baby from the hospital, just born, and she puts the baby down to sleep at night. She knows at some point that baby's going to wake up and want to eat, right? But because she knows that, is she causing the baby to wake up and eat? Absolutely not. No. Knowledge does not necessitate causation. So just because God knows what we're going to do doesn't mean he's causing us to do it. When God elected to create this universe, he knew you and I would be standing here talking right now, but he knew we'd be doing it freely. So when he elected to create this universe, this was predestined to occur because he's outside of time, but we're still freely talking. So he hasn't overpowered our free will. He always knew, say, Adolf Hitler wouldn't be a Christian. And he always knew that Billy Graham would, but he did not cause Hitler to not be a Christian and Billy Graham to be a Christian. Other than, if you want to say, when he created this universe, he knew they would. In that sense, he had caused it. But they still freely chose to believe or not to believe. And the same thing is true with us. When God elects to create this universe, he knows how everyone's going to ultimately turn out. But we're still turning out the way we do freely. This is why my co-author, Dr. Norman Geisler, wrote a book called Chosen But Free. Because we are chosen in the sense that when he elected to create this universe, he elected the outcome. But we're also free because what we're doing here, we're still freely doing. In fact, I saw um, someone uh, yesterday point this out. Let's suppose you could get into a time machine and go forward to tomorrow. And uh, you saw that your husband went to a pizzeria and he ordered pepperoni pizza, right? And then you came back to today and you know that tomorrow he's going to order pepperoni pizza, right? Are you causing him to order, to order pepperoni pizza because you know he's going to? No. So when it gets to tomorrow, you were in the time machine. You went forward and saw him do it. He's going to do it, but he's still doing it freely. So God is outside of time. He knows what we're going to do. Okay, so on the on another version, like perspective of that, the mm -hmm. Christian side, what about Calvinists? Yeah. Like how do you, I guess, biblically argue that with Calvinists? Well, I point out to Calvinists that Calvinists, depending upon what variety of Calvinists you're talking about, some of them believe we don't have any free will at all because they don't seem to understand that knowledge does not imply causation. They think if God is sovereign that we don't have any free will. I actually think God, is, I think God is more sovereign than they think because I think God is so sovereign that he can get his will done through our free will. And this would be a morally bankrupt universe if we didn't have free will. It would also be immoral for God to judge us if he's causing us to sin, Ooh, right? which actually is the biggest problem with Calvinism on my viewpoint. It makes God the author of evil. It makes God basically Allah, that Allah does everything. Well, if that's the case, this whole thing's a sham, right? So, and if God wants all to be saved, as the scriptures say, and God does all the choosing, why isn't everyone saved? Because we have free will, that's why. We have the ability to choose to believe or not to believe. And, of course, if you want to have a moral universe, you've got to give people free choice. Otherwise, it's not a moral universe. We're just moist robots, and that's not a moral universe. Moist again, that's going to throw me off. What's that? Moist again, that's going to throw me off. Yes, moist robots can throw you off. That's right. Um, okay, 
I was listening to Felicia Masonheimer this morning. She did an interview with someone I don't remember, and, and she was kind of talking along this line too, I guess, of some newer philosophy, like coming down the it? ropes. Who was Felicia Childers? Felicia Masonheimer. Oh, okay, sorry, go ahead. She wrote, um, Stop Calling Me Beautiful. She's another uh, I always tell that to people. Yeah, Stop Calling Me Beautiful, yeah. Actually, Where, I've never where's said your that. wife when we need her? I've never her. said that in my life, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> never had to. <laughs> I really right. wish I had something clever to say right now, but I've got nothing. Okay, that's okay. Okay, I'll let you keep the mic. Um, but she was going on kind of along these lines, too, of I, I'm trying to remember exactly. I wish I remember the term. Um, I might have to go look it up and... See if I can explain it. I'm sorry. Let me guess. Is she is she saying that we put too much emphasis on physical looks in this country and we have to? No, it's it wasn't it else? wasn't it wasn't about about her book. Okay. Um. That Christians, I guess, leaning towards God puts everything, you know, in everything in order in the world, and because He is sovereign. I feel like it's pretty similar to Calvinism, but because mm -hmm. he's sovereign, he's constantly putting things in the way so that even if you're trying to make your own will, you still can't because he's going to... And I think the, the example they used was, like, someone's driving, and they're going to go rob a bank the next day, and so that day a deer runs in front of their car and crashes their, you know, they crash their car so now they can't rob the bank the next day. Mm -hmm. And something to that effect of God's intervention into mm -hmm. everything so that everything aligns with him. Does that make well, sense? Well, that, that's, that's one theory, but that would pretty much take away our free will. For example, right. if God were to stop every murderer every time he tries to murder somebody, then this would be a morally, uh, this wouldn't be a morally robust universe. It, it, it would be comical, you know, that every time you tried to do something evil, God stopped you. So, so how do you, you go on the other side? What's that? How do you go on the other side then when God does get involved and does stop things from happening? Well, he may do that, and sometimes we can sense him doing that, particularly in the scriptures. Uh, and so he might be doing it all the time right now, right? right. But we, we might not know it. But that doesn't mean he's taking away all our free will. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of the time when people talk about this in the context of whether Calvinism or Arminianism or Molinism, they will say, like Norman Geisler. Molinism, my, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. My co author, Dr. Norman Geisler, would say that God does not work coercively, he works persuasively. Hmm. So he persuades, but he doesn't coerce. And if he coerced, it wouldn't be a true following. You wouldn't really be loving someone who coerced. You can't coerce love. All you can do is be persuasive. C.S. Lewis famously said, that God cannot ravish, he can only woo. If he's going to allow us to maintain freedom and allow us to love him in a proper way, he can't ravish us, he can't just decide to take us over, he can only woo us, he can only persuade us. So God works in persuasive ways, not coercive ways. But, you know, if God wants to intervene and, and stop something, uh, some natural disaster, or he wants to heal somebody, or do, he can do that, of course, anytime he wants. Those, aren't, don't have, don't, those don't have anything to do with free will. Those things just sometimes happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. So somebody who's, like, I've heard of this a lot with, especially with, like, abuse. Well, why didn't God stop that from happening? Mm. And they'll have even maybe later examples in their life that they felt God did intervene in their lives and stop something from happening. Yes. What, what they're forgetting that? is something known as the ripple effect that every event that occurs in this life ripples forward to affect trillions of other events. This has helped me understand why does God allow a tragedy to occur that I can see no good of coming from? Why does God allow a baby to die? You know, the whole church prays and the baby still dies, right? This gentleman over here, blind, why hasn't God healed him? I don't know why he, God hasn't healed him, but I know why he I know why I don't know why. Because I'm inside of time. God is outside of time. He sees the end, end from the beginning. What, did, what it was said about the guy that, um, oh, gee, I can't remember it now, that uh, this happened in his life so that the glory of God could be seen? Why was this man born blind? Why was this man born blind? Yeah, so the glory of God would be, would be expressed in him. 
I don't know why God doesn't make everything right all the time, but I know why I don't know why. God may have a reason for allowing these sufferings and these pains to continue because there's going to be a ripple effect that's not only going to affect the person, but everything else and even long after. In fact, a baby dies today. Maybe that baby dying today ripples forward through a series of events. So 500 years from now, a great evangelist rises up and saves millions of people. Can I see all those ripples? No, but God can. So the ripple effect allows me to rest in God. In fact, you can see the ripple effect in the scriptures. The greatest ripple effect, of course, is Jesus. Why? Here's the only guy who's truly innocent who gets treated brutally. He's completely innocent. He gets treated brutally, yet it's the greatest ripple effect in history that people are eternally saved from punishment and given his righteousness because of what happened to him. And then you see smaller instances of this, like when Joseph is sold into slavery by, uh, by Judah and his other brothers. You remember what happens to him? He gets abused in Egypt, but then he rises to prominence somehow, puts a whole bunch of grain aside in order to, uh, f uh, to have grain if a famine comes. And then the very people, his own brothers who sold him into slavery, leave Israel to escape the famine. They come to Egypt, and Joseph recognizes them. And what does he say as soon as he sees them? You dirty rats, you're going to pay for what you did to me. No, he doesn't say that. What does he say? He says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, the saving of many lives. In other words, the ripple effect occurred in their lives. They could see it. They did the evil. It rippled forward and helped them later. And I submit to you, if you think about your own life, there have been ripples that have occurred in your life that you didn't want to happen. You didn't want the wave that made the ripple or the the rock that went into the water that made the ripple, but that rock that went into the water rippled forward, and now you're going, up. Oh, that bad thing happened back then, so this good thing could happen later. You've seen that, and most of the time you don't see it. That's good. All right? Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Amber. Rob. Yes, I'm not. Um, you spoke of the cosmological argument. Yes. And we've done your studies on the, you use the acronym SURGE. Uh-huh. Okay, it's been a couple of years. I'm wondering, in the intervening time, do you see any updates or any additions you could have from what we've learned through science and cosmology and astronomy over these past couple of years that you would see would enhance your book, enhance the position of SURGE? Uh, I will uh, quote what William Lane Craig says about this. The last century has been a continued attack on the standard Big Bang cosmology model, and every time it's attacked, it comes out on top. All of the, all of the efforts to overturn what's known as Big Bang cosmology have failed. And the only thing that's happened recently that I know of is the James Webb Space Telescope. And you may have seen in the popular media some people saying, oh, the Big Bang is wrong because of the James Webb Space Telescope. Exactly the opposite is true. The James Webb Space Telescope helped us further see how redshifted the light is, which demonstrates there was a beginning. What the James Webb Space Telescope helped us discover, however, is some theories of early galaxy formation need to be updated because those galaxies that they saw through the James Webb Space Telescope shouldn't have been there if some aspects of gal galaxy formation were what they thought they were. Now they're going to have to go, well, galaxies somehow formed earlier than we thought. And so they're trying to figure that out. That's now. what I was thinking, yeah. right there. Yeah. And, and coupled with that, the BGV. The BGV theorem? Yeah, the board goose right. valenkin theorem. That uh, being came the math in 2006. Guy. Yeah. yeah, being the math guy. Yeah. I see that as you know, it, right there in the middle of the surge. It's, right, and it, it is. You could add that, and in fact, um, uh, Craig would put it this way, and this is what that's what Vilenkin Bord, was referring Guth, to. and Vilenkin and right. I had up earlier here. Right, that's what he's referring to. Would say to. that any universe in a cons in a state of expansion. Uh, had an absolute beginning, basically, where it's, it's, it's expanding, and that's what this universe is, according to the theory. Now, I don't understand the intricacies of the theory. I'm just giving you kind of the bottom line. And this is why Valenkin says, yeah, there was a beginning, even though he believes in the multiverse theory, that there are other universes out there. 
But Vilenkin admits, he says, even if there are other universes out there, the whole show needs an absolute beginning. So it seemed to me then you don't get rid of the need for an absolute beginner, right? No. Yeah. So if, if, if there are the universes out there, A, who's creating them? <laughs> and uh, B, you'd have to have a fine tuner to fine tune these universes. And C, there's an absolute beginning to all the other universes, so you're, exactly. still, you're still getting back to a beginner, even if it's true. So I was just wondering if you, if you had rec uh, accumulated some, some more material that would be only enhance your position. Uh, you, yeah. you could talk yep. about BVG theory, like yep. I said, which came out after this book came out. Um, we could fold in the James Webb stuff if we wanted to, but it's, it's just coloring around the edges. The essential arguments, or I should say the essential evidence for the beginning of the universe is still the same as it's over, always been. Still got the second law, the universe expanding, the radiation afterglow, the great galaxy, the galaxy seeds, seeds may be updated. That's the one yeah, and Einstein's theory of relativity and the fact that you can't have an infinite number of days before today, otherwise today never would have gotten here. All those arguments are still good Absolutely. for the beginning. Thank you. All right, thanks. Good question. All right. Well, folks, I want to thank you for coming out tonight and hanging out so long. And the folks that are watching out there, wherever you are, thanks for being here. Thursday night, we're going to be at Valdosta State down in Georgia. And this will also be live streamed. What time is that? Is that 7 or 7.30? I can't, I can't remember the time. It's on our YouTube channel. Check it out. So I hope to see you guys at Valdosta State. And uh, folks, thanks for being here at the University of Vermont. All right. God bless you guys. See you.